Good morning, Megan. How's my uh, sound this morning? Loud and clear. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, COVID-19 Mitigation and Management Task Force um, for December 3rd, 2020. Um, thank you for joining us today. We have a very uh, full agenda, and um, so I'd like to go ahead and um, 
kick it off and turn it over to um, Megan to begin the roll. Um, before I do that, I want to um, point out that um, we've had some challenges uh, regarding the uh, use of um, public comment during these meetings, and uh, we've we've worked on addressing that. I believe part of that is due to the fact that there is a delay uh, between our meetings here and uh, how they are um, presented on YouTube. I believe there's about a two minute delay. And so um, what we're gonna do is if you are um, going to uh, be making um, public comment or, or wish to make public comment at uh, this morning's meeting, we ask you to go ahead and make sure you are dialed in per the instructions on the agenda. And, uh, and, and uh, you can go ahead and begin to test uh, whether you are uh, unmuted or, or otherwise. And then when we get to public comment, we will wait for um, um, over two minutes in order to account for the delay in uh, between the um, YouTube site and the um, and what's going on on the Zoom meeting that we're watching as well this morning. So, just wanted to put all of that out there now and uh, before we call the roll. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Megan uh, Worth Ranson um, to go ahead and call the roll. And please mark me present. Thank you, Richard. Richard, 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 Richard me. Uh, present. Jamie Amy Black. Present. Nate Gilberton. Hogerson's present. Alicia Gonzalez. Present. Brett Brown Johnston. Johnston's present. Megan Marie Branson here. here. Chris Lake. I see Chris, Chris Lake on my bed. Dr. Stapleton. Sorry about that. I couldn't mute myself. Hi, this is Dagny. I'm here. You West Wesley Parker. Here. Mark Martin Henry. Here. here. Hi, Tyler Morgan. Morgan. Hey, Megan, this is Caleb. Um, just as a, I don't know if others experienced it as well, but your um, your voice on the system was very broken up. Um, would like to see if you could um, uh, drop off and come back on um, to see if uh, um, that that fixes that. If not, we can do it during a break. Um, I just want to let you know there's a. Uh, uh, in fact, let's do that during a break. Um, just wanted to let you know that there was a break uh, in all of that. So. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and close out the, the roll call and move to public comment. Um, if you're calling in to make public comment this morning, um, we're, we're, we're asking you to, to go ahead and make sure that you're on the system. Uh, our uh, administrator, Jackie, who is working on this, if you could go ahead and um, uh, unmute the system and uh, individuals who would like to make co public comment, please go ahead and um, and, and unmute yourself right now as well. And uh, we will begin to make public comment here in a minute. Again, I just wanna let you know, we're gonna wait uh, for two minutes once this agenda item is open and, and uh, in order to make sure that there is a, uh, a, a full opportunity for others to make public comment. Um, no action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included 
on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair. Comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint. Because there is no physical location for this meeting, public testimony under this agenda item uh, may be presented by phone. To provide testimony during this period of public comment, call in after 9.30. Uh, and uh, you can continue to read these instructions on um, the agenda. Please make sure you press star six to unmute yourself and um, star six to mute yourself again when you're done with your public comment. Please be advised that the YouTube stream that is associated with this Zoom meeting will be approximately 60 to 90 seconds behind the live meeting. If you'd like to present public call comment, um, please call in using the um, above uh, line that was mentioned previously during the live meeting. Um, also, one last thing before we open it up to public comment. Um, we have received um, public comment from um, several folks who, who have presented it in writing. Uh, that has been distributed um, to all of you and uh, as a part of the meeting packet. I uh, want to remind you once again to make sure that you're, um, you're reading these um, public comments from uh, Debbie Duval and Nicole Thomas, both of which are provided on the website in your meeting packets and uh, in, in, in the emails that were provided for you today as well. So with that, I would like to turn it over to um, the first uh, public comment uh, provider. And, um, and if you would please identify yourself and uh, make your comment, we will be limiting public comment to two minutes. So, um, Please go ahead and begin. Thank you, Caleb. This is Debbie DeValve in Las Vegas. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Please go ahead, Debbie. Oh, good, good. Um, I'm actually going to read a portion of my email just also for the audience that is also uh, dialed in to listen. Um, Mr. Reynolds and Task Force, I have some questions for you. Um, how can private businesses become an arm of the government and a medical facility to enforce governor directives when they have no license or training for it? How can businesses as public accommodations deny service to those who cannot wear a mask and need to come in to do business? Why do businesses have to feel afraid to be fined rather than accommodate a maskless patron, even though they have valid conditions under Directive 24? which should allow them in. Why is the Nevada Equal Rights Commission backlogged for months with discrimination complaints? What is the cost of all this? We've become spies on each other, where one phone call could cause thousands of dollars of damage to the offending business. Our courts are becoming burdened with lawsuits, fighting fines, civil rights violations, et cetera, not to mention the mental stress, anxiety, and suicide. Yes, we may slow COVID at least until we all come out of this pause, then what happens? We start over again with another pause or worse. I'm not saying COVID isn't real, but are these efforts to produce fear, control, and track us worse than the disease? With any risk, there should be a choice. We take risks every day as soon as we walk out the door. Also, heart disease is still the leading cause of death, but are we treating this the same as COVID? As our nation has navigated through COVID, the U.S. Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, has been conveniently ignored in the name of science. But science is a method to find truth. It is not the truth. When our inalienable rights have been put back as top priority, then the American people can be trusted. Just give us the facts and the risks, then let us make our own educated choices. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for your comments. I'm glad you were able to call in. Is there additional public comment at this time? If you're, I wanna make sure we're providing ample opportunity for public comment. I'm not hearing any public comment. Uh, if you are calling in and attempting to make public comment at this time, um, we, uh, we need you to press star six, identify yourself and make public comment. Um, following uh, the last public comment, I'm going to leave it open for an additional uh, 90 seconds in order to ensure that um, we are, um, to make sure that we're in line with the YouTube presentation 
uh, where others may be joining as well. I will confirm during this 90 seconds that uh, I was able to call in, hear public comment and uh, hear Ms. Deval over my phone while uh, she was making public comment and, and could have unmuted myself to make public comment as well. Is there any additional public comment at this time? Okay, apologize for, um, for uh, burning the clock on this one. We wanna make sure that we provide um, plenty of time. So we're at about a minute right now in about 30 seconds, we will close public comment unless there is additional public comment. I'm not hearing any additional public comment. It's been a minute and 40 seconds uh, since uh, um, the last comment, since we started making comments. I'd like to um, remind everyone that there are two um, uh, pieces of public comment, one from Mr. Valve, who just spoke in during the meeting uh, and, and another within the packets and on the website, we ask that you read and review that uh, material as well. And I will ask one, one last time, is there any additional public comment at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before we close this item out, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, there's an additional public comment uh, opportunity at the end of this meeting and uh, at, under agenda item 10, and we will go back to that uh, and, and, um, and go through the same process in order to make sure we're accommodating um, this important part of our public meeting and public meeting process. So with that, I'll close out agenda item number two and move to agenda item number three. We have the November 19 uh, minutes that are provided, that were provided um, during uh, or through your meeting um, packets that were emailed, also available on the website. Um, appreciate all of the hard work that went into providing these. Uh, if you've had an opportunity to review these, um, please uh, take, please uh, make any recommendations for changing these or um, uh, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Okay, this is Colonel Compson. I make a motion to, uh, to approve. Dave Fogerson, second. We have a, uh, a motion to approve and uh, a second um, from Colonel Comston and Dave Fogerson. Is there any discussion on um, the uh, item under consideration right now? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed vote no. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, that concludes uh, agenda item number three. We'll get those updated uh, and uh, finalized and, and provided it back on the website as well. So um, right now, as you all know, a couple of changes this week before we, we uh, kick off to the next um, few items here. Um, you'll notice the second half of the agenda includes um, a couple of updates from state partners uh, and um, community partners as well, as well as um, uh, trade organizations that can provide us updates um, during this meeting. I'd like to, um, while well, I will take this agenda uh, out of order in order to accommodate some of the schedules of some of the people who have who joined us today. I see President Whitfield here from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, who, has, uh, who has joined us. And uh, I know that, um, um, uh, Superintendent Ebert will be um, providing an update as well. And, and uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Gonzalez, if you could let us know if um, Superintendent Ebert has any preference on when she'd like to go, we'd, we'd be more than happy to accommodate her. But before we get to the appointed department updates or the current situation report um, and the overview, um, I'd like to make sure that uh, we, we provide an opportunity for um, President Whitfield to um, um, provide his overview 
and uh, update to this group here. So with that, I will, um, we will go to agenda item number eight. This item is for discussion only. It's an update on COVID-19 response with UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And uh, we're joined here today by um, UNLV President, Dr. Keith Whitfield, um, who will provide the task force with an overview of mitigation efforts for students, faculty, and staff at, the, at UNLV. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Whitfield to uh, provide his remarks and serve before you get going and just say, it's a pleasure to meet you. We haven't met in person, but um, uh, grateful that you've chosen to come to the state of Nevada and lead, and we look forward to your presentation today. Thank you very much, Caleb, and thank you for your time today and for inviting uh, me to talk about uh, COVID-19 case response mitigation and preventative efforts at UNLV. As Caleb mentioned, my name is Keith Whitfield. Uh, I use this term loosely these days, but I am the new president of UNLV, um, just passing about 100 days on the job. And so as you can imagine, it's a unique position to be in uh, starting a new job, but let alone starting a job as a president of a university in these times that we find ourselves in. I want to start by thanking you and thanking Governor Sisolak for all the support UNLV has received as we've navigated this pandemic together. We still have farther to go, but I truly believe that the road ahead of us is shorter than the one behind us. Next slide, please. So let me tell you a little bit about UNLV. UNLV has more than 31,000 students. We consistently rank among the top campuses in the country for our undergraduate student diversity. A majority of our students are Nevadans, about 85% of them, and our on-campus housing population is about 1,850 in a typical year, and we have about 4,000 employees. UNLV is home to the only accredited school of public health in the state which has been a tremendous resource to the region throughout this pandemic. Next slide, please. So I was asked to join you today to specifically discuss UNLV's efforts in response to COVID-19. These efforts have been guided by federal and state government directives, the CDC, the Southern Nevada Health District, NSHE, and experts at UNLV. Our actions since the beginning have been coordinated through an incident management team that includes more than 30 members across the university community. These efforts have been guided by federal and state directives, the CDC, the Southern Nevada Health District, and she, and experts at UNLV. The team considers all aspects of course delivery and university operations, policies, protocols, and processes. And, it's is and it issues guidance and directives for students, faculty, staff, contractors, and visitors to UNLV. Next slide, please. UNLV began monitoring the coronavirus outbreak in January and issued health alerts to our faculty, staff, and students to keep them updated. We launched a coronavirus website in February to make sure, to make sure that there were readily available resources to inform and educate our community and broader population. The incident management team began meeting weekly in March and UNLV partnered early on with, Southern, with the Southern Nevada Health District and found tremendous expertise in Brian Labus, an outstanding epidemiologist and assistant professor in our School of Public Health. He has also been serving on the governor's medical advisory team. The university shifted to predominantly remote operations and fully remote classes in mid-March, immediately following the spring break. As cases increased in the surrounding community, UNLV advised students to move out of the residence halls and provided prorated refunds for room and board, those board, that board mean meal plans. All of these actions reduced campus density, which minimized potential exposure. In the weeks that followed, all study abroad was suspended, as well as university sponsored travel internationally and domestically. Our university services and a majority of our business operations also quickly shifted to remote, including telehealth for both physical and mental health. Telehealth has been an incredibly important service for all members of our university community, and we acquired additional online mental health tools to meet the increased need among students, faculty, and staff. Next slide, please. So when courses shifted to remote learning 
and our residence halls were vacated. We also made university buildings accessible via key card or key only. We closed high density spaces, including dining services and the libraries, and our libraries continue to provide services online and by phone. We developed and launched an online self-report form on April 4th to capture necessary information from faculty, staff, and students who tested positive. This helped us to identify others at UNLV who may have been exposed and if there were spaces that needed to be sanitized. It also helped us to deploy resources to employees and students, such as leave information for our faculty and staff and arrangements to make up classwork for our students. The form and process is HIPAA compliant and Clery Act compliant. A response team reviews each reported case and assists that individual. Non-identifying information for each case is then publicly posted to the university's coronavirus website in the interest of the greatest transparency to keep the university and broader community informed. UNLV continues to gather information and publicly post each case in real time after it's investigated. UNLV has continued throughout the year to reinforce preventative measures, sending out frequent communications that complement, support, and adhere to Governor Sisolak's directives and efforts. We also have standardized on-campus signage and posted at every entrance that face coverings and social distancing are mandatory. The university also prohibited all tobacco and vaping use on its properties. Next slide, please. Based on public health guidance, UNLV was able to resume limited on-campus operations in June. Most services continue to be offered remotely out of an abundance of caution. We required all faculty and staff to complete an employee training prior to return to campus and offered training to students. Students enrolled for in-person courses were required to maintain social distancing and to wear face coverings at all times. All faculty, staff, and students and visitors are required to self-monitor daily for symptoms and stay, and stay home if they exhibited any symptoms. They also were required to follow CDC guidelines regarding self-isolation and self-quarantine. As the public health situation evolved, we adjusted our plans for fall, eventually shifting to 80% of our courses to remote delivery. Of course, classes within schools of medicine, dental medicine, and nursing are operating under different protocols due to the requirement for clinical experience. Additionally, we limited our on-campus housing to about 900 students, which is about half of our usual capacity. We also set aside rooms for isolation and quarantine. We put plans in place to care for students in our residence halls who are isolated and quarantined by including twice daily food delivery. To further reduce on-campus density last month, we encouraged our students to move out early this semester and about half or more than 400 students chose to do so over the Thanksgiving break. UNLV athletics operated under special protocols as instituted by the Mountain West Conference, which I'll discuss in just a bit. Next slide, please. Course delivery this fall has launched real-time lecture delivery, full online courses, and limited in-person courses, incorporating all safety measures. Some courses have provided flexibility for students to participate in live lectures and discussions either in person or online. UNLV limited in-person classes to no more than 50 students and moved classes into larger rooms to ensure ample social distancing. Additionally, we shifted course start and end times to minimize congregating outside classrooms and limit unnecessary interaction between class times. UNLV has not identified any instances of COVID-19 inf infection resulting from in-person courses this fall. While we have students who have attended in-person courses test positive, the courses have maintained mandatory face coverings and social distancing. Instructors have opted at times to move to temporary remote instruction out of caution, but none were required to do so as a result of infection in their classrooms or labs. Our medical, dental, and nursing schools continue to operate under special protocols per requirements for uh, clinical instruction. For spring 2021, 
UNLV plans to continue limited in-person courses to no more than 50 students and maintaining social distancing in larger classrooms. We anticipate that less than 80% of our courses in the spring will again be offered via remote delivery. This, of course, is subject to change based on the governor's directives and public health guidance. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, UNLV publicly reporting positive cases back in April on its coronavirus website. A monumental development and gaming game-changing resource this fall was the expansion of the UNLV contract tracing team. There were numerous volunteers in the School of Public Health assisting beginning in March, supporting the University and Southern Nevada Health District in managing cases, an effort owned for seen by Brian Labus. Thanks to a $3.4 million grant uh, funding from the state, the contract chasing team is now 200 strong and is even in a greater asset and resource to the university and the health district. In the week before Thanksgiving alone, the team investigated nearly 1,100 cases. This team is an incredible asset as we work to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, and we're grateful for the financial support from the state. The university hopes, hosts a real-time interactive dashboard with cases posted as soon as they are reported and investigated by contract tech tracers. Each time a case is reported to UNLV, a well-defined series of steps are initiated the contact tracers call each reported individual to identify close contacts in need of quarantine and determine necessary actions. This may include sending a notification to campus, enhanced cleaning of, of, of a space, or isolation or quarantine of students who live on campus in our housing. Overall, UNLV has managed to keep numbers of our cases well below the rate of infection in the surrounding community. As of yesterday, UNLV had 213 individuals who tested positive for COVID-19 on campus while infections dating back to, uh, while on campus uh, for infections dating back to March 25th. Of those, 181 were students, 27 were staff, and five were faculty. Overall, we've had 482 cases reported to UNLV since March, and more than half have never, uh, were never on campus while infectious. Next slide, please. A few of the actions UNLV has taken related to preventative measures in its buildings include upgrading our ventilation filters, flushing water systems, enhancing cleaning protocols, and reconfiguring mini space for social distancing. While we also installed plexiglass barriers and more than 700 hand sanitizing dispensers. We have continued many of our business operations and services remotely, which has allowed us to keep our population density on campus low. We have distributed supplies on campus, including 12,000 cloth face coverings, 25,000 disposable masks, 5,000 bottles of hand sanitizer, 1,100 disinfecting kits, and 1,300 teaching station cleaning kits. We have ample supply to fulfill orders for these supplies need they be refilled. Much of our business operations and services continue remotely, which has allowed us to keep our population density low on campus. Um, universities, university libraries reopened and were limited to Nevada system and higher education students and required an ID for entry. We also reduced dining service offerings and adjusted seating inside and outside for social distancing. Our on-campus health center continues to offer telehealth and is seeing patients after telephone screening. The health center also is conducting limited numbers of COVID tests for students, faculty, and staff as needed. Next slide, please. Our coronavirus website includes important announcements, guidelines, and practices for employees, students, visitors, parents, training modules, and how-to videos and testing locations on and off campus. We have utilized multiple avenues to reach our, our audiences, including university-wide communications, student-specific emails, and social media posts, as well as faculty-specific lists, outreach through deans and chairs, and articles in the UNLV News Center. 
Multiple university experts have contributed to hundreds of traditional news media stories to help educate our university and the broader university or the broader community. We also look to our UNLV family to create a social media campaign called I Wear My Mask For, featuring video of our students, faculty, and staff. Our schools of nursing and medicine have created how-to videos for properly washing your hands and wearing face masks or coverings. We began promoting the Nevada COVID Trace app in early September and have shared it with students, faculty, and staff via email and social media. It remains posted on our COVID-19 uh, website. We continue to reinforce requirements and preventative measures through on-campus signage, including printed and digital material. Next slide, please. Athletics continues to be guided by the Mountain West Conference and it's conducting regular PCR tests of its student athletes, coaches and staff. They also restructured practice sessions beginning with fall sports teams during summer to minimize potential infections. Our fall sports seasons began late and while we were able to have limited fan attendance at first, uh, Currently, we've ceased attendance in accordance with the governor's recurrent directives. I'd also point you to a very recent occurrence, which was uh, we were scheduled to play Boise State in football uh, this Friday, but out of uh, an abundance of caution about the situation that exists in both states, we decided to cancel that game. Next slide, please. UNLV Medicine launched one of the first COVID-19 testing sites in the state and conducted more than 18,000 tests from March 23rd to July 31st. UMC launched a, test, launched a testing at UNLV in May and has conducted more than 130,000 tests, accommodating as many as 1,900 per day. The partnership between UMC, Clark County, University Police Services, and the Nevada National Guard has served a vital role in testing in Southern Nevada. The School of Public Health, as previously mentioned, has been an invaluable resource throughout the pandemic. From volunteers to its now 200 paid contact tracers, they are a critical part of case mitigation in Southern Nevada. Brian Labus has played a key role in advising on operations throughout the spring, summer, and fall, and as we look forward to next year. The School of Public Health will continue to be an essential part of our planning efforts as we look to vaccine distribution in the coming months. Faculty and students from dental medicine have provided emergency services to hundreds of patients, alleviating strain on local emergency rooms. Many of our nursing faculty, students, and alumni have assisted as first responders and healthcare professionals in hospitals, clinical clinics, and home health organizations. Dozens of UNLV faculty have donated personal protective equipment and other equipment from their labs to the local medical community to aid in the COVID-19 response. Faculty from nursing and engineering have created hundreds of face shields and related PPE for local first responders and medical professionals. Since the early days of the pandemic, a team of UNLV scientists has been assisting health officials by making viral transport media a crucial part of specimen collection kits needed for transport to processing labs. More than 50,000 vials have been produced by the start of the fall semester. The School of Medicine's Psychiatry Department partnered with the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services to launch a helpline for our state's healthcare professionals to help them cope with increased stress and anxiety. Additionally, the practice, UNLV's Community Mental Health Clinic continues to offer telehealth and has been a resource to community providers to assist them in transitioning quickly and competently to telehealth care environment. Next slide, please. So I hope the information that I've shared with you this morning is helpful and I'm happy to answer any, any, any of your questions. I also invite our faculty expert and epidemiologist, Brian, if he's on the call, to fill in any details he'd like to mention as he and his team have continued to work on the front lines of contact tracing efforts in Southern Nevada. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, President uh, Whitfield. I, I want to say on behalf, this is Caleb Cage again for the record, on behalf of the, um, the entire task force and all of us here, I want to uh, once again welcome you to the state of Nevada and, and also thank you for, for your leadership during, this, during these uh, 100 days that you've been here. Congratulations on that. I do see that uh, Mr. Labus is on as well. Um, so before we open up the floor to any questions or comments from the group, I'd like to see if uh, he has anything he'd like to add. Um, the way I look at this contact tracing team, this is not just for COVID. Uh, this is the beginning of a relationship between UNLV, the Southern Nevada Health District, the State Health Division, uh, to look at how we can use the resources in our state to track all kinds of disease. COVID is just one of the things we deal with, but as soon as we get through COVID, there's a mountain of other cases that haven't been touched in months that we have to investigate. There's salmonella and E. coli and syphilis and all those cases that nobody's done anything about. And we look forward to being part of that and helping the community recover from this. Because once we get past COVID, uh, there will be additional outbreaks. There will be other things that happen that, that we need to take care of. So I guess it's a positive thing that I'm already thinking past the end of COVID. Uh, but this is really a long-term relationship that we want to build. And this has been part of the discussion with the state from the beginning. It's part of the state contact tracing plan. So I know everybody here is focused on COVID, uh, but we're really looking at this as an opportunity for UNLV to help the entire state of Nevada for whatever comes next. Thank you for that, uh, Brian. And, and we know you've been a part of the, the discussion from the very beginning with the uh, medical advisory team and others. And we appreciate your um, your service to the state and your your information here as well. And and you're right, it is a positive thing to be looking beyond uh, COVID. I think all of us are um, trying to make sure we can do that in a responsible way, but also making sure that the lessons we've learned from this process, uh, from this pandemic can uh, help us and can benefit us in the future as well. So thank you and thank you for your uh, additional remarks here this morning. I'd like to open up the um, floor to other members of the task force right now. Um, to see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, Julia, was that a hand raised? Julia Peek? It was an awkward hand raised. Yeah, at first I just wanna thank uh, President Whitfield. Nice to meet you um, electronically. And then Brian um, as well, thank you. Um, and I do wanna just acknowledge all your state's support. Um, one of our biggest challenges has been IT and I, I wanna acknowledge your IT team. They stepped up early on to try to help us get all the connections in place that we needed to help us with computers and computer labs and, and truly any issue that we presented uh, to your team, they came through with solutions at a speed that was uh, incredible. So I do wanna thank them publicly. The other thing I wanna acknowledge is all the work that uh, your school's doing related, related to the minority health and equity, specifically supporting the coalition. Uh, your team's been doing focus groups, uh, put out mini grants to communities that have been affected, and that information is helping us look at how we uh, message and educate to those communities. And so that's been uh, such a valuable partnership that we can continue in the future. Um, again, I want to thank Dr. Labus. He was here well before me in the state supporting epidemiology and will <laughs> will be here in the future. And I look forward to continuing that partnership. Um, I'll say past COVID, but I don't think COVID will ever leave us. So um, in the future to address many things, including COVID. Uh, I do have a question though. Um, as we look at the quantity of cases coming into our public health system, we too are looking at a way to automate uh, data collection on cases. And I was really interested to hear that you're already doing that for cases um, on campus using a HIPAA compliant tool. Um, if you don't have the answers now, that's okay, but I would really like to learn more about that. And can we uh, piggyback on that as we potentially open that up to maybe the general public? We're looking at tools today with CDC actually. And if you have a solution, I'd love to hear about it. Um, the, uh, the tool that we're using is actually a, um, uh, a data collection service, just like SurveyMonkey or one of those other ones called Qualtrics. Uh, there is a HIPAA compliant version of that. So we've created forms with that and it allows us to do some really interesting things. So as soon as somebody files a report, there are a few of us that get a message. If you check the box that says, uh, I want to hear from the student health uh, services, I want a provider to contact me, they automatically get an email that says, here's, here's what you have to do. Um, so we use that to collect all of our data. That data goes to our contact tracing team. They then do the full case investigation, starting with all the data that people self-entered. Uh, so that saves some time there because we just confirm some things rather than going from scratch. Uh, and then we have another tool we use to send the data back to the university 
for the UNLV related things. So we can put in the information of these are the rooms that need extra attention from the cleaning crews, or uh, these are the additional things that need to happen on campus. And it's really allowed us to send information back and forth rather quickly. Um, the other thing that we've done really on the surveillance side, I know you have the, the tools that you're using for the statewide dashboard. Uh, we have to track all those things and we set it up so that everything we do goes in a Google sheet. And then we actually have a, um, a thing called high charts that pulls the data from there and gives us real time information. So if you go to the UNLV website, the data that you're seeing is accurate as of this very second. Um, and so we've been able to use those tools to cut down a lot of the work, but still there's that, that issue of somebody does ultimately have to interview them and that does wind up still taking a lot of time. And let me just add that that is an incredible, uh, the reporting tool and the reporting dashboard we have is incredible and, and appears to be extremely real time. If you just leave it open and watch, you will see it click, you know, one at a time, sometimes two at a time when new cases are identified. It, it seems to be working very, very well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Brian, uh, actually Qualtrics was one that another state's using and we got a demo. So looking forward to talking to you all uh, offline about that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you and I appreciate that conversation. Are there, um, Melinda Southard, I know you have been managing the Binax process. Is there, um, since we have President Whitfield here and Dr. Labus, um, is there any updates we can provide uh, to them or opportunities to collaborate there? Uh, sure, thank you. So um, I definitely, I did reach out to, um, I forget the name, but um, I did reach out to UNLV to this morning um, regarding Binex Now testing. And so we are eager to partner with you um, to offer the Binex Now test in um, those higher level institutions. Um, it's basically, it's an, it's a antigen test that can deliver results within 15 minutes. Um, and it's best used on those that are showing symptoms within the past seven days. Um, we've had very good results with the sites that we've deployed them to recently. Um, and so just really looking forward to the opportunity to partner with you all and um, see how we can de deploy the Binax Now test um, possibly in UNLV and other institutions as well. Uh, thanks for that comment, Melinda, and I would take my cues from Brian, but I'd also like to encourage you to reach out to Chancellor uh, Melody Rose, um, who is over the system, because it sounds like something that we could use on lots of our campuses. One of the challenges that we have is that we have very, very different kinds of college campuses. Uh, as you saw with the uh, University of Nevada, Reno, um, they have kind of a closed campus, and when kids go up there, um, they they tend, tend to stay on campus, and so how they test and how they think about their strategy is different from uh, Nevada Southern or uh, a UNLV that has a bit more of a, a far less actually. I mean, if you think we have 31,000 students, but we only have 1800 beds, um, we have a much more porous campus. And so thinking about what kind of testing I think will be essential to, to some of them even more so than others, but that sounds like a wonderful uh, new advancement in terms of testing and how quickly we can get the results back. So um, if, if you need any help uh, making that contact, please just reach out to me. Absolutely, thank you so much. And I did reach out to Chancellor Rose as well, and she's the one who gave me the other contact. Um, and so I have been um, trying to reach out to them. And I did want to also note that this test does require the CLIA waiver um, for the sites that do administer the test. So there is that bit of administration that has to go into it, but we've been working very closely with the regulatory agency um, on that process. And so they're able to do a relatively um, quicker turnaround of the approval. And then we can also deploy the test um, before full approval is um, received, just with an acknowledgement that the test can't be actually administered on an individual until that uh, CLIA certification is in place. Thanks. We have had a uh, discussion about the rapid test on campus, just a beginning discussion about that. So uh, your email is not the first time that we've been thinking about it. Um, we talked about our student health center having those appropriate waivers and if that was a place we could do those tests, because if that's the case, we could use the laboratory we already have on campus and those regulatory issues are already taken care of then. Excellent news. Thank you so much, Dr. Lavis. 
Do we have other questions or uh, comments for uh, President Whitfield or Dr. Labus uh, following their presentation at this time? Uh, Caleb, if I could just, um, I, I shouldn't be doing this because I am a little busy, but I would like to offer um, myself as a resource. Uh, I'm actually a gerontologist by training and have been serving on one of the uh, COVID uh, uh, review task forces uh, that exist out there, particularly looking at older adults and how they uh, would actually take the vaccine um, in terms of its, its uh, development. But also now we're having conversations about its rollout and some of the issues uh, particularly related to minorities because my expertise is in African-Americans. Um, and so if there's ever a time when I might be able to help give you uh, some perspective on that, particularly as we get to the rollout and delivery of vaccines, I'd be happy to uh, offer my two cents to you. Um, that is an amazing offer, and uh, I can see Candace McDaniel smiling. Okay, never in, mind. I take it back. I I can assure you that um, we would we would aim to be as respectful of your time as we possibly could, but that's not an offer we would ever turn down. So we've got Director um, Director Whitley here, um, and and other others from Department of Health and Human Services (DPBH) as well as the uh, immunize, immunization program for the state. Um, and uh, we will reach out to um, Vice President Newby and um, set up a meeting that again is as uh, respectful of your time as we can possibly be, but um, we, we, we certainly would value that input. Um, and and I, know, I know without question, I can, I can answer for the group that that's the case. So thank you for that offer and thank you so much for uh, your presentation today. Most important, thank you for uh, your leadership and what you're doing to um, keep the uh, members of your community at UNLV safe and healthy. Well, I wanted to thank you all again for all the work that you've been doing. Um, I most recently came from another state and so I know how it's been going there. Uh, and I think that we, you guys are actually doing a good job. You know, don't, don't necessarily rush to pat yourself on the back because there's so much work to do. But I think that we are actually mitigating, managing um, some of the expectations, even the searches that are going on. I really do think that you're going doing well. Um, and in terms of the volunteer work, you know, Brian is my uh, uh, is my role model. And so uh, anything I can do to help, anything UNLV can do to help, to be able to make sure that we try to keep our footprint small, to be able to keep uh, those mitigation strategies being communicated to the community, uh, please rely on us to be able to help you with that. We absolutely will. We look forward to following up with you. Thank you, Dr. Whitfield. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Labus, as well. Um, we appreciate that presentation. Uh, we're going to continue on with the agenda at this time and move to, uh, let me open up my agenda again. Um, that was a nice segue from President Whitfield regarding um, the vaccine. We're going to move now to agenda item number six, um, Candace McDaniel. Um, from the, uh, um, for, uh, the Chief of the Health Bureau within DHHS and Shannon Bennett will provide an overview of Nevada's plan to distribute the vaccine here in the state. Uh, many of you heard uh, the update from the governor last night um, and uh, this will build upon that I presume and we look forward to um, hearing from you and, and your presentation. Um, I'll turn it over to Candace and you can begin on agenda item number six. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, as was mentioned, uh, Candace McDaniel, I am a Bureau Chief in DHHS. And then we also have Shannon Bennett, who is the Program Manager over the Immunization Program. Um, we're gonna touch on the COVID vaccine now. And then we also have a member of our team, Renee Broker, who's actually going to be reviewing some of the flu data um, after our presentation. Next slide, please. So very, very quick agenda of what we're going to be talking about, um, the COVID-19 vaccine that's in the news. We're going to touch on the Nevada allocation, redistribution, our county level readiness, um, a little bit about our long-term care facility, and then um, data reporting. Next slide, please. So our program submitted our initial uh, vaccine playbook in October, which seems like such a long time ago. And a lot of things have changed in that time. And so we were able to publish um, our second version yesterday, which is on the Nevada Health Response website. 
um, because things have moved quickly and we've also gained a lot of knowledge since October. And we were able to support a lot more detail with distribution. Um, so please feel free to you know follow that link and, and read through that. It's lengthy, but there's there's a lot to, involved with this response. And so I um, just wanna be able to provide that. Next slide, please. Uh, you may have seen this chart previously in our timeline. And so we find ourselves um, still in phase one, but um, that red circled area is where we've been focusing a lot of our energy and planning. And what we're looking at is our, our initially our, our healthcare workforce. Um, and so uh, you probably heard we have a, are expecting a very limited amount of doses um, in this initial allocation. And as we move through phase two and phase three, as um, additional vaccine is manufactured and uh, the probability of additional um, types of vaccine coming out, we can anticipate increase in our allocation um, where we will be able to move through the tiers outlined in the playbook um, as we move through the general population into um, spring and summer of 2021. Next slide, please. So some vaccine in the news you may have seen. So we are expecting both Pfizer and Moderna who are showing early efficacy at about 95%, um, something that we are incredibly encouraged with. Um, Pfizer and Moderna both filed for emergency use authorization with the FDA. Um, so Pfizer was 1120, Moderna was 1130. Uh, our, the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee are going to meet on December the 10th to review the Pfizer product. They're going to be meeting on December 17th for the Moderna product. Um, and these are dates that obviously we're watching very closely. Um, where we expect the, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to either meet concurrently with these or uh, within 24 hours. And so once those two things happen, um, things are going to be moving incredibly quick here in Nevada. Next slide, please. For allocation, so um, I will say that um, the total allocation number for December is trickling in um, as of really late last night. So we are assuming either today or tomorrow, we're going to get that, uh, that official communication from the CDC and uh, we will know exactly what our December allocation will be. Um, and each county has been submitting their initial orders for tier one. So we're very much supporting that planning for them. And um, like I said, once those review committees are completed and distribution begins, um, it's going to move quickly. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand it over to Shannon Bennett to talk about redistribution. Thank you, Candice. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I want to walk through some redistribution pieces with all of you. Um, as Candice indicated, we are watching that December 10th date when Pfizer will be heard by the FDA's independent review um, advisory group. Uh, after that date, things are going to move very, very quickly. So we are uh, focused on that weekend following the 10th and into the following week. We believe we will be um, redistributing these doses that following week. As a reminder, these, these doses are the ultra cold ones. So it requires a lot of logistical planning as we um, figure out how to move those doses around the state, but we plan to be doing that for the first time that following week, um, thinking starting on the 15th or the 16th or some, something like that, watching and knowing that this is a very fluid process, but um, watching that very closely. Um, we will be planning re weekly redistribution while we're working with this ultra cold vaccine um, to all of our Nevada counties. We are at the state level responsible for our rural and frontier counties in Nevada, um, Carson, and we're also uh, responsible for redistributing those doses to Carson City Health and Human Services for, for the quad counties. Um, and then Washoe County and Southern Nevada will be responsible for uh, moving the vaccine around their respective counties as well. Um, and then we're working to ensure proper tracking and chain of custody of vaccine. As you all can imagine, the logistics required around this requires um, a lot of planning detail and, and we are working through all of those um, components um, and finalizing them as we speak. Next slide, please. 
As I, as I mentioned a moment ago, this has been a uh, very detailed planning process with all of our counties. All of our counties have a slightly different approach to the way that they will be doing uh, the vaccine response. We have currently all of our county level public health vaccinators are enrolled in the pandemic provider program. Um, that is a requirement to be able to have custody of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and almost all of our acute care hospitals are enrolled or nearly enrolled. There's a few little, little pieces that are struggling behind, um, but have plans in place to make sure that they're all ready to go um, during that, that week that I indicated before. And we're doing a lot of vaccine confidence with our counties and other partners. Um, we started a doc talk series um, for Nevada physicians. We've been doing that every week for the last few weeks, um, walking through different details about uh, the vaccines themselves, what the distribution process will look like and how uh, physicians will be able to be vaccinated and their staff will be able to be vaccinated in, in these coming weeks. Um, we've also been supporting our hospitals with hospital office hours um, and answering all of their different questions regarding the vaccine confidence or uh, regarding um, anything that they have, uh, any questions they have regarding the di distribution and the um, logistics for the vaccine response. Um, and then we're working with our partners, uh, specifically Immunize Nevada on vaccine confidence campaigns. We're working on our joint information um, center uh, for some PSAs, getting some information out to the public and then thinking through some upcoming media campaigns um, as we start broadcasting this out to, to all Nevadans. Next slide, please. Wanted to give an update on long-term care facilities today. Um, we have opted in as a state of Nevada into the pharmacy partnership program that the federal government has organized for us. Um, CVS and Walgreens will be serving all of our long-term care facilities with only a few exceptions. Um, and those few exceptions typically are if a facility has opted out or if they fall outside of a 75 mile radius from one of the Walgreens or CVS stores and then we're working to identify other vaccinators in those situations. Um, right now, skilled nursing facilities are being matched with uh, a, an associated pharmacy. Um, so we're watching all of that happen in, in real time. And then wanted to um, share that news with the group also that on Tuesday, I believe, CDC's uh, ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, voted to include residents with phase 1A. So staff and residents will be able to be vaccinated at the same time with this recommendation, which, which is great and exciting news for our long-term care facilities and looking forward to working closely with Walgreens and CDS in the implementation of that program. Next slide, please. Um, and wanted to touch on data reporting. We are making plans to be able to evaluate how we're doing uh, when it comes to our vaccination response and knowing how each of our priority groups are um, looking with our vaccine uptake. So just wanted to provide that insight. We will be using, of course, Nevada WebIZ, which is our very powerful tool to track vaccination across the state uh, nearly in real time. Um, in addition, uh, we will have some other reporting um, components to this in aggregate form so we can watch this data come in week to week. Um, and I believe that is it. You can go ahead to the next slide. I believe that's it for me. Um, thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Thank you both for that presentation. I know it's been a lot of presentations lately to um, community partners and uh, the media last night with the governor as well as today. Um, we, we really value what you're doing and, um, and want to make sure that uh, we have as many opportunities to get your information out in front of the public as possible. So um, thank you for, for, for allowing us to um, bring you back here today and um, uh, have a discussion and ask questions. I'd like to open the floor right now to members of the task force to see if anyone has any questions regarding uh, the state vaccination effort and um, uh, or anything related to the presentation we just heard. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Candace and Shannon. I, I think that's a, uh, not a sign that nobody's interested, but a sign that you're, you're getting your message out and people are 
um, uh, grateful to hear what you have to say. So thank you both very much for, uh, for your presentation and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and keep moving and let you move on with your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, just as a reminder on the agenda for for everyone here, um, we have another um, uh, update on vaccine development efforts from a trade organization, Pharma, and uh, that'll come later in the agenda. But I wanted to uh, make sure um, Candace and Shannon were able to present early, and um, uh, so we'll we'll go ahead and close out this agenda item and uh, move on to. Um, uh, agenda item number four, which is appointed department updates. And um, we will uh, begin with um, Director Reynolds from the Department of Business and Industry. Director Reynolds. Caleb, thank you very much. Uh, this is Terry Reynolds for the record. A couple of things I wanted to point out. Uh, to date, we've done uh, 10,360 some uh, uh, visits uh, to businesses. In addition to that, we feel that about uh, 5,200 complaints, and those are complaints that come in from uh, employees, employers, uh, concerning uh, issues with business. And so we uh, use those, we have a referral process that we can go through and go back to those businesses. In the last two weeks, we visited um, about 260 businesses and with referrals and, and second time uh, we've gone through and visited about uh, 280 second time businesses. And I'm pleased to report that we're actually getting uh, very good compliance. Now we're in the you know, mid nineties to high nineties uh, across the board. There's a couple exceptions and we're working with those uh, individual uh, construction areas. One of them is construction mainly in Southern Nevada where we've had some, some low compliance numbers, but we're bringing those up and, and that has improved dramatically. In addition to that, we're seeing some issues with you know, smaller uh, retail like convenience commercial where we've seen uh, problems with that. So in, in addition to that, sorry about the phone in the background, but uh, we have had to uh, uh, make sure that uh, businesses understand what the rules are. And so our safety consultation and training team has actually gone out and gone to several new businesses uh, that have actually asked for uh, assistance. And so we have asked just a minute. Sorry about that. That's the problem with uh, being at home. But our safety uh, consultation and training group has actually gone out to literally hundreds of businesses to work with them in terms of how to comply. And that crosses the board of, of manufacturing, uh, mining, uh, construction work, and all sizes of different businesses. We spent time, for example, with Mount Rose Ski Facility uh, in terms of how uh, they would develop their safety protocols. We also spent time with you know, large retail operators, uh, uh, grocery stores, uh, and the construction industry on how they can comply. So we're not just going out and, and in issuing citations, we're also on the other side working with businesses to make sure that they can comply. Uh, I, I would uh, direct you to our OSHA dashboard uh, and you can break down and look at the actual complaints uh, or uh, where we have made visits to different businesses and actually drill down and see what, what businesses those are. And with the complaints, we actually have a log that's included in there that will show you uh, what, uh, what the complaint was, what the referral was, and uh, the actions that were taken with that business. So just wanted to make sure that if you want to get the whole picture, you can go through and do that uh, in our dashboard. It's also broken down by, by zip code and by area within uh, our major uh, metropolitan areas within the state. Caleb, thank you. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much, Director. And um, uh, I think we all remember I had an 18-month-old interrupt me last meeting. So uh, a phone is uh, is perfectly reasonable. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I just make a quick note uh, before we move on to DEM. And Dave, I know that you've got to jump here to for some travel. Um, I, uh, I moved on without... Uh, 
uh, acknowledging that Renee Brocker is here and is going to provide an update on flu. I apologize for that, Renee. Uh, we'll get through this uh, agenda item and go back um, to you next before we do the status update with, um, with James, okay? All right. Good, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Dave, we'll go to you. Thank you, sir. Dave Fogerson from Division of Emergency Management. The status of our PPE order is in the uh, minutes, or I'm sorry, in the packet for the meeting. We've pushed all the school PPE out and we're working on getting the, school, the charter school PPE out right now. It should be out by uh, within a week or two. They've been working on it for a little bit now. We have a, a large amount of no cost to us additional PPE that FEMA provided to us and that we have in stock at the warehouse. Quite a large quantity that a lot of us were able to get. We're pushing that out and it should be in local government hands by December 25th. Our gloves are the weak link and they are nationally the weak link for everybody. Right now we have 28 days worth of gloves on hand, but we have deliveries that are planned into December that should get us back up to where we need to be. We are constantly filling PPE, lab, slot, lab swabs, and by next now test kit orders out of the warehouse as frequently as all day long, every day of the week. Uh, on our grant side, we have 91 public assistance grants to state and local governments, the amount of $131 million. Uh, as of Tuesday, we were able to push $39 million out to local government and to the state that was both approved by FEMA and by us. And our coordination piece, we're continuing to coordinate between all levels of government partners across the state, multiple meetings, multiple phone calls, trying to make sure that everybody's in communication. Uh, we instituted a new thing that once a week, uh, Department of Public Behavioral Health executives and us get together to make sure that we know the same information, we're sharing the same information and make sure that there's no gaps between the two of us. And that's the end of the report unless you have some questions. Uh, I do not have any, any questions. Um, I know that um, uh, you have to jump off here. So I wanna make sure that uh, everybody else has an opportunity to ask you any questions they may have uh, before you go. Um, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair Cage. Uh, Felicia Gonzalez for the record. Uh, uh, David Fogerson, I just wanna say thank you so much on behalf of all these um, school districts and charter schools. Um, your team has been phenomenal in, um, in, in distributing the um, PPE out to school districts, um, especially coordinating with other agencies and, and getting um, these items delivered to the smaller, more rural districts. So appreciate your work. Thank you. Absolutely. We got a great team here at DM that has done a lot of work to make this happen. So thank you for that recognition. I'll pass that along. Thank you, Felicia. Any other comments? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Chief. Safe travels. We'll go now to uh, Ms. Leslie Mullenkamp to provide a uh, fiscal update on where we stand with CRF and CARES Act funding. Leslie Mullenkamp with the Governor's Finance Office. Um, my report today will be fairly short. Um, we are uh, at the, the last four weeks of the avail availability of the coronavirus relief fund, and uh, which is the main component of the CARES Act funding. And um, so this, uh, our focus has been uh, very much on uh, responding and using any kind of resources that we have available for the search. And so there has been a lot of activity related to that. Um, you know, there was uh, certain funds that were set aside, you know, should the surge occur. And of course, we're we're definitely um, seeing that and um, trying to put push those resources out as we had uh, hoped we wouldn't have to, have to do. But of course, we're we're here doing that right now. So uh, again, um, just just managing the last of that. Uh, we have four weeks left until the fund uh, is no longer available, and so there's a lot of moving pieces and parts at this point. Um, and I think uh, at at that point. Uh, uh, pretty much I, that that's my final report. <laughs> if there's any questions, I'm, uh, I'd be happy to answer anything. Well, thank you so much. And, and um, this, is, this has been, um, uh, I guess, six months of uh, a heavy lift for you. And we really appreciate 
all of the work you've done. I know we're, we're meeting later today to talk about some opportunities, but um, really just want to express my gratitude to you um, for getting us to, um, to, to every possibility that we could use these resources for on behalf of um, the, the people of the state of Nevada. So thank you for that. Um, Thank you very much. I think that gives me just a, a brief opportunity. I end up being the face of the team, but um, we have two other uh, really key uh, people in our office, uh, Jennifer Cooper and Nikki Hovden, who are, um, uh, they are just amazing. Uh, Jennifer in particular has been working with 28 different local governments um, to ensure that they get all the funding they need. Uh, Nikki has been uh, essential in making sure that we can get through the state system for our uh, agencies and programs. And uh, so anyway, I have to tell you, uh, they are really the key backbone of, of being able to push these dollars out. So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to thank them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we share our gratitude with them as well. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, we're going to continue on with this, uh, this agenda item now and move to um, the Department of Education. I know we have a full presentation later, but I want to make sure that uh, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez has an opportunity to present. Thank you, Chair Cage. I will um, be moving my um, update into item number nine. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Black, Gaming Control Board. Thank you, Chair Cage. Good morning, everyone. Jamie Black, Gaming Control Board, for the record. Um, with regard to our inspections for the month of November, and these numbers are reported through 1127, our Enforcement Division has conducted 1,632 inspections, uh, only two new violations. So that brings our total number of violations to 201. Uh, all in all, with regard to casino resorts, it still appears that the portions that fall under the board's purview are adhering well, uh, including locations like employee dining rooms. So good compliance overall. End of report. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and you're continuing to receive referrals from the local health authorities in accordance with Senate, uh, Senate Bill 4 as well? Correct. That has definitely improved over the last couple of weeks. So, yes. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Continue on with uh, Association of Counties. Hi, Mr. Chair, Dagny Stapleton, NACO Executive Director. Um, counties are continuing uh, their work um, for their parts that they're responsible for the public health response for COVID. Um, continuing to support testing and contact tracing efforts in many of the counties um, and working hard on the activities that many of them outlined to this task force in previous weeks and months. Um, want to thank the state for all of their support and partnership on a lot of those efforts in some of our counties, especially in some of the smaller counties. Um, county emergency managers, if you, if you, as you have heard, are also working on their um, vaccine plans for distribution. So all the counties are working hard on that. Um, and just to follow up on um, Leslie's presentation from earlier, want to thank GFO on how good they've been to work with um, for the 16 counties that receive the CARES funds directly through the governor and GFO. Um, Leslie and the staff in that office have been really great. And I know counties are um, finishing up uh, the expenditures of those and, and the reporting. So thanks to GFO for that. Great, thank you very much, uh, Director Stapleton. We'll go over to um, Director Harper with the League of Cities, please. Thank you, Chair Cage, Wesley Harper, Nevada League of Cities. Uh, I'll start by echoing um, what Director Stapleton talked about with GFO. Uh, we have been talking to all of our members and they have all had very uh, wonderful things to say about their partnership, uh, working with the governor's finance office and helping to understand what the parameters are and move funds. So thank you uh, on behalf of the league for that. Uh, we've also been talking to all of our members about uh, their partnerships um, with their counties for doing business inspections and checking for compliances. Uh, the cities that have uh, you know, direct purview and governance over businesses are working you know, very directly hand in hand with those counties, as you can see in the reports. Uh, there are, we have 
a good deal of members that do not have governing um, authority over their businesses. But what they've been doing is they've been in conversation with the businesses as more of an as ambassadors to let them know what the guidelines are and to answer any questions, especially if they've had a uh, visit or they know that uh, Nevada OSHA is around to inspect other businesses. These municipalities have been answering a lot of questions and providing guidance. Also, uh, we have been encouraging uh, the use of the COVID trace app. The municipalities have been encouraging their employees to use them, the businesses that they govern to use them, uh, to, to use the app. And so uh, they've been pushing out on their social media platforms, et cetera. So thank you to the state for the resources, Julie, especially for the information that she provided on the COVID trace app. And uh, we will continue on in the report. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I saw the, the exchange uh, yesterday regarding um, vaccination efforts. And so uh, hopefully you've been able to get the um, at least first steps of uh, those questions answered and we can, we can follow up if necessary. Yes, indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we'll now go to uh, Dr. Lake, Chris Lake with the Nevada Hospital Association to provide some uh, comments. <laughs> Thank you, Caleb. Um, before I get into uh, the current status of the hospitals, I, I just wanted to uh, say a couple words about the statement that I wrote on Monday in the daily hospital stats that I'm afraid, um, as it was taken out of context, became a distraction maybe for this group as well as uh, for the governor's office. The paragraph uh, talked about vigorous uh, need for mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing, and enforcement of the 14-day quarantine or the CDC quarantine. Um, and then there was a, a single sentence in there that was taken out of context related to the effectiveness of various measures. That, that paragraph was not specific to Nevada, and uh, it was intended to communicate some of the obstacles that public health and hospitals and other organizations have in fighting this disease. Um, when the association saw that it was creating a distraction through Twitter and through some of these other mechanisms, the association internally decided to take that down, remove the sentence so that it would not become a distraction, which seemed to actually compound the issue at hand. So I just wanted to explain a little bit of how that all transpired. Um, I, when I wrote that sentence, I did not think it was nearly as provocative as it turned out to be, uh, particularly in the face of millions of people literally getting on airplanes the day after the CDC issued a no travel uh, request. So um, I apologize to the committee if, uh, if it was a distraction for you. And uh, I know that uh, the governor continues to take questions on it at the press conference. And I wanted to, to get it out there in the public uh, as to what the intent was. It was not a political statement at all. And it was not uh, specific to Nevada as well either. So with that, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, the current hospital status. We're continuing to see a steady increase in patients. Uh, we're also starting to see an increase in uh, very serious disease, including the need for some ventilators as well as intensive care. Um, we do have plenty of ventilators. That is not an issue uh, at this point. I don't, I don't want to, uh, to get that uh, misconstrued, but but we are seeing an increase in people that need that level of care. Um, as of yesterday, 1,513 confirmed cases were hospitalized, 352 patients uh, required intensive care, and uh, 202 people uh, required mechanical ventilation. That equates to about 30% of those people that are in a hospital for any reason are COVID patients. Um, and, and the hospitals are feeling the strain, but are currently managing the, uh, the crisis and the stress. Um, we are seeing a, a backup of what I will refer to as eligible discharges. Those are people that could be discharged to a skilled nursing facility, to a psych or rehab facility, um, and not necessarily COVID patients, just patients in general. That number is continually increasing. Uh, we are working with the state and with the Department of Public and Behavioral Health to come up with some strategies to, to try and counteract that. But um, right now that, that number is uh, upwards of about 200 patients each day 
that could be discharged to another facility and free up those beds. Um, we are uh, the hospital association. We meet with the hospital CEOs um, regionally, um, one group at least daily. Um, we uh, discuss the current situation in each hospital, where they're at, who has available ICU beds, who has ability to take patients, transfer patients, uh, things of that nature, so we can level load and, and balance. Um, that seems to be working very well at this point. Staffing, however, remains a, a constant concern. Um, and this is uh, because A, we, we had a nursing shortage prior to COVID. I just wanna put that out there. So we started from a deficit um, and then we have the increase in patients right now. And we also have, uh, as this disease becomes uh, relatively endemic in the community, staff are also people, their family gets exposed, they're required to have the stay at home order um, or they're waiting for tests, et cetera. And that diminishes some of the staff out of the hospitals, further compounding that, that issue. Um, hospitals are using uh, team nursing methods, uh, relatively uh, standard now across the, across the state. Um, they are looking for um, travelers and per diem nurses to come in and fill uh, some of these uh, needed positions. Excuse me, um, I, I'll point out that the cost right now of a traveler nurse is between $180 and $250 an hour. Um, it is a zero sum game for lack of a better term. Uh, there, there are only a, a finite number of registered nurses that are qualified and licensed and available in the United States. And pretty much every hospital in the state is in the, or I'm sorry, in the nation is in the same problem, uh, experiencing the same problem and competing for those type of uh, resources and nurses. Uh, as far as medically necessary uh, surgeries and outpatient procedures, that is being handled on a case by case basis um, between each hospital. Um, some hospitals have, have uh, elected not to uh, to do those and to take a pause, if you will, for a couple of weeks. Other hospitals that are continuing to do them have a meeting every single day with the CEO, the chief medical officer, the surgical teams, and they're evaluating each one of those individual surgeries based on the urgency, based on the available resources, based on whether they'll, it'll require a hospital admission uh, following the surgery. Um, and they, they are managing their calendar literally daily um, for those scheduled surgeries that are medically necessary. I, I'll point out that one of the things we found as a the hospital industry um, when we did cease doing those was the backlog um, was, was difficult to get through. And we sometimes compounded the, uh, the patient's uh, illness or ailment um, cause you know, more pain for that patient as they went through um, without having a lot of uh, benefit. Um, these were patients that may have not even been required to stay in the hospital. It did not free up the right type of medical personnel to treat other people. Um, and it did not uh, free up uh, even some of the, the PPE in, in many cases. So uh, we learned that these have to be evaluated on a case by case basis. And the best way to do that is to look at the surgical schedule for the, the, pre, the next coming day, um, literally every single day and make a, a case by case determination. And that, and that is what we are doing. Um, crisis standards of care, uh, I'll mention briefly, is being used, um, as many people know. Um, we are treating people at Renowned in the Alternative Care Center. Um, the the uh, other facilities have uh, triage uh, tents and things like that out in front to, uh, to make sure that they can use the resources the best they can. Um, PPE, uh, unlike in the early days, uh, PPE right now is uh, stable. Um, we're in a relatively good position at the hospitals with PPE. Many of the larger medical centers are reporting that they have an excess of a year of available PPE uh, on hand. We've been uh, making as many purchases as possible so that if there was another supply chain problem, we would not, uh, we would not find ourselves behind the eight ball like what happened in uh, April. Hospitals also are working uh, very much with Shannon and her team and Candace uh, on vaccines, getting ready for uh, the, the vaccination of uh, critical healthcare workers. 
Um, we're anticipating that very soon. And uh, to, to just conclude this, um, as far as flu is concerned, we are not seeing a tremendous amount of flu um, in our hospitals uh, to date, recognizing it is very early in the season. So uh, that is not uh, unanticipated. So with that, I'll, I'll close my report. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I got a couple of uh, questions here. <clears throat> do you know, do we know any of the, um, so the challenge of discharging patients from the hospital to the skilled nursing facilities, it's been a discussion that we've had for some time. Um, and I know Director Whitley has had a couple of conversations uh, or many conversations on it with his team as well. Um, do we know what the, um, what the reasons are that the skilled nursing facilities have for, um, uh, for the, the delay in transitioning the patients from uh, you know, the hospital bed to a skilled nursing facility bed? Right, so there, there, there's actually a, a whole menu of issues to go on uh, that, that cause that. And we're not even talking necessarily about COVID patients, so it's not just about waiting for a COVID test, et cetera. It is, uh, it's a, a plethora of things, uh, including uh, some guardianship issues, including the, co the COVID test issues, um, including just space. A lot of these uh, skilled nursing facilities themselves are full. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it's a matter of trying to find those beds throughout the state and matching them up. Um, but it's not just the skilled nursing facilities. They're, they're just, you know, they're a, a portion of it, but it is also uh, asymptomatic uh, COVID positive patients that are on legal 2000s that can't get to, uh, into a psych facility. It's um, the same type of issue with rehab facilities. Um, so so it, it, it's compounding as the number of COVID patients and the community uh, spread um, grows. Thanks, Chris. Um, we, we also had a, a conversation with FEMA and DHHS in the region, uh, region nine yesterday and um, they had a question, and I believe we have uh, Dr. Graydon on as well, who may be able to provide um, some, some additional uh, input into this as well. But um, they had a question regarding, you know, we see a, we see a typical flow of patients from, uh, uh, um, you know, an increase in positives leads to an increase in uh, hospitalization. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty one-to-one -one, um, correlation. And then from, uh, hospitalizations, we'll see an increase in uh, ICU as a subset of hospitalizations. And then, of course, <clears throat> as we see that initial increase in patients, uh, five weeks later, we'll see an increase in deaths as well. So it's, it's they're, they're step down, they're smaller curves each, but all of them follow the same trajectory. And they pointed out something that we've discussed internally and as well, and that is we're not seeing the increase in ICU patients um, at this time uh, that would correlate to the increase in hospitalizations, but we are seeing uh, the increase. I think today's number of deaths was 45 deaths from COVID-19. Uh, we are seeing increased hospitalizations and increased deaths, but we're not seeing increased um, uh, ICU. Do you have any explanation for that? Do you know if there's anything about um, is it on the treatment side? Is it on how things are counted? Uh, any explanation we might be able to consider for that? So, so there are some some explanations for that, and uh, and I'll I'll put out the disclaimer that they're all anecdotal from from talking with practitioners. But there there's a big belief that a lot of it is the actual treatment. The treatment regimen has changed. It changes uh, frequently as we learn more about the disease. Um, so we've learned that, you know, in the early days, ventilators were pretty much given to everybody. Then it was high flow, uh, high frequency, high flow nasal cannula. Um, then we learned about proning and now we have, you know, then it was remdesivir, now it's decadron. So, I mean, we have learned more and more about what works and what keeps these people out of the ICU. Um, Although we are, like I, I stated, we are seeing a, a little bit of an increase in those ICU admissions now as well, um, not, but not nearly to the, the curve that, that we're seeing in just general hospital admissions. As far as the, uh, the, the deaths and without the ICU admissions, uh, 
some of the uh, explanation that I've heard is people are getting advanced directives now. Um, the older population, they 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 realize that COVID uh, strikes them harder, um, and they're they're getting their financial situations in order. They're not, you know, they have no code orders. They have things of that nature um, that preclude them from going into the ICU, um, they're, and they're taking hospice as an option, things of that nature, um, which may explain some of it. But uh, I don't know if that answered some of your questions. No, I I, I think that that does explain uh, some of it, and and I I'm just um, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. I think it's something that we definitely need to explore. Um, we we're seeing uh, all of that would make sense if we were not seeing, and and I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, but there's something else that's that's leading to the. Um, uh, the number of deaths on on the other side that's increased as well, um, and if they're taking hospice, that would make sense. You know, those sorts of things add to that. Um, but uh, one of the things that we'd heard uh, was happening in other states was that there were um, hospitals were diverting COVID ICU to specific units and um, and therefore counting them as COVID patients writ large, but not counting them against their ICU. And I'm not I'm not saying that that's a uh, bad practice. I just think that that is the sort of thing that um, the data uh, isn't showing us, but but we would want to make sure that we're tracking as well. Yeah, I, I can definitely look into that and see if uh, if our hospitals are setting that up as a uh, as part of their COVID wards or COVID units, if they're whole, maintaining those those uh, intensive patients within those instead of moving them to the ICU. Um, that that uh, that's entirely uh, acceptable medical practice. However, no question, know. no question, and 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 this isn't intended to question that. I would just want to make sure that our our data and our awareness are are tracking that um, as a change, um, right. and and uh, that's that's the benefit of having these conversations. And I'll note as well that you'll be here uh, next week uh, with with members of your. Um, your your board again to provide us an update on hospital capacity as well. Right, great. Thank we'll you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, other questions from uh, from members of the um, task force to uh, Dr. Lake, Director Whitley. Sure. Um, I think it, I think it would be good. Um, this is Richard Whitley, Director for HHS, for, uh, for the record. Um, I think it would be good if we could start capturing that discharge data with more detail because, I mean, I think, uh, Chris, as you mentioned, it is complex. And the only way that we can strategize to, um, to solve the, the uh, sort of bottleneck of, of pending uh, transfers or discharges is to really know what the problem is. And so, um, I, I think if we could quantify that more, and that's we're working on that now in Northern Nevada and um, um, Commissioner Kirkpatrick reached out to me yesterday. We're doing a similar thing in, in Southern Nevada. Um, I think that the issues are different in Southern Nevada. It seems to be more of a mix of psychiatric patients um, who are also COVID, psychiatric patients who are on a, on a a legal hold because they're a danger to self or others, and who also um, test positive for um, for COVID, um, and the waiting for for uh, skilled nursing facilities. Um, in the north, it's primarily um, waiting for skilled nursing facilities. But digging in deeper in terms of um, like who are the people? I, I know at one of the the largest hospitals, half of the people are are not uh, are not recover are not haven't recovered from COVID. So they're it's um, they're a fragile uh, group with underlying health conditions, and so that's really important that we not push too hard on skilled nursing facilities and send them to facilities because. That, 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 that may put them at higher risk because they're not performing adequately on an infection control. So it, um, I, think, I think there are strategies and solutions, but 
I, we need to be informed about them. I've directed um, Deputy um, Dwayne Young from Medicaid to be the lead with a strike team uh, made up of clinicians and of, and frankly, of welfare eligibility workers. Because as many of you, I, I hope know, Medicare doesn't really cover long-term skilled nursing facilities. It's a limited number of days. And so um, what we're seeing, what we saw at the largest hospital in Northern Nevada was the majority are on Medicare. Um, not Medicaid. And so helping to understand like, you know, the financing and the health condition and all those things go, go into supporting that uh, discharge. We, we want to be helpful to the hospitals who have an obligation to do an appropriate discharge. Um, but I think we need to look at the data. So that's one thing I think it, we, that needs to be, be, we need to start collecting that and whether that the, the, the periodicity of that is daily or weekly um, so that there's actionable items appropriate to what the needs are. Um, I commit to that uh, to, to, to do. Um, and then I, I also, uh, Chris, in the context of, of um, you know, just the the becoming a crisis in acute hospitals with beds and availability. Um, I'm concerned about the staff, and I wonder if if that data is collected, like um, on uh, you mentioned nursing staff and the the shortage before the pandemic. But do we collect data on um, how many nursing staff are on quarantine and that you know th that whole piece? We don't uh, collect that, and, and thank you for the question, Richard. Um, th that would actually be a really uh, interesting point to collect. What we do collect is the number of uh, intensive care, intensivists, intensive care nurses, and intensive care staff that are out sick um, or out ill or called in ill. They could be calling in ill because of a family member, et cetera. But um, that is the number that we capture and it's used as a benchmark, if you will, to monitor uh, PPE effectiveness, uh, to monitor baseline, see if we have an increase. Um, we haven't been asking about other, other uh, nursing staff or, or doctors in the facility aside from the intensive care um, to this point. Thank you. Um, if I may, um, Chair Cage, um, I think um, that would be helpful to see. I would be interested in also just the survey that is um, um, provided to each hospital on what's collected. I think, you know, as we have moved into the pandemic uh, and, and what was, you know, an acute crisis is now feeling more chronic. Um, I think sometimes just, I know this for my agency, sometimes fresh eyes looking at information that's collected can suggest fresh strategies. And so I would, I'd like to see just the survey of what questions are, are being asked. And um, again, with the intention of just how we, how we can be helpful. I noticed that in some other states like Washington state, they do, their hospital association is collecting that um, uh, quarantine data, and I, I think that's helpful with a with a workforce shortage to help prioritize. You know where we 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 need to target resources or look at scopes of practice and all those things. Um, you know, as as we go into it, it'd be nice to 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 to, to be doing that now. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that, and and I want to. Um... I think your your framing this your framing of this is extremely important, and and I want to make sure um, I want to make sure that that everybody knows when we're talking about this this challenge that we face uh, in the transition or that the hospitals bring to our attention. This isn't a logistics problem, right? It's not. Uh, these are these are human patients, and um, they they there's a uh, a, a challenge in. Um, ensuring that their medical needs are being met uh, at a time during a pandemic. And these are often people who are in very vulnerable populations. Um, and so I think it's always important to, to say that uh, in, out loud for our group. I know we all understand that. And, uh, but it's, it's important to say that, that this isn't just a, um, you know, we need, uh, we need more beds here and, and uh, there are beds here and we can move from A to B, that there, there's a lot of um, 
uh, humanity involved in this process. And of course, that's our, um, that's our goal to facilitate that. What I'd like to do um, as a part of this going forward, Richard, is to have you work with uh, Megan and with me on our team to uh, develop a, an agenda item on this topic so we can, we can have you um, brief and provide an update and have a discussion on that if that would be, uh, if that would be okay with you going forward. I think it's a great idea. I think I think it's so timely right now, um, and and again having an openness to just freshly look at things. I mean, this is now where the problem is or where a problem may may reside. We need to look at it. We might not have been looking at it before because it wasn't a problem. But um, I th I think that. Same with the healthcare workforce. It's a chronic problem in our state. It has been for for a, a decade. Um, you know, made worse with the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of of uh, of Medicaid and payer sources for people. Where do they go? And then add on top of it the pandemic. Um, it, it it presents a challenge, um, and we can't compete with other states for nursing workforce and pools. Um, and so we, we do have to look at this. And um, I do think there are solutions within it, but um, the only way to get at the appropriate solution is to actually better better identify the problem. I agree. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to having that discussion and and um, and working with you and Chris and Brett if we need to. Brett Salmon from um, the Skilled Nursing Facility Organization as well. Um, so thank you. Um, I'd like to just open it up one more time to the floor and see if anybody has any additional questions or comments before we move on um, back to agenda item number six and talk to um, Renee about the um, uh, flu shots and influenza uh, vaccination underway right now. Um, any other further comments on this agenda item before we move on? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that was an important conversation, important discussion. I appreciate everybody's uh, patience as we went through that. I'm going to go back and close out agenda item number four, open up agenda item number six. Uh, Renee, if, uh, if you could go uh, provide your, your presentation now, uh, and then we will go to um, uh, Superintendent Ebert next um, for agenda item number nine, followed by agenda item number seven. So go ahead, Renee. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, hi everyone, my name is Renee Broker. I'm a CDC Public Health Advisor with the Nevada State Immunization Program. Um, and I will be just briefly going over the um, influenza vaccination data dashboard that we just recently launched. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to go over briefly um, our flu, flu vaccination activities this flu season for the 2020-2021 flu season. Um, flu vaccination is a critical part of the COVID-19 response, and it's more important than ever to decrease the burden of respiratory illness on the public and the healthcare system. As of now, flu activity has been minimal, but um, flu season is always unpredictable and it can pick up, and so we want to have that precaution in place. Um, so NSIP received $1.3 million in supplemental funding from CDC um, to enhance flu vaccination coverage during this flu season. And we subgranted this um, funding to Immunize Nevada, um, Carson City Health and Human Services, Washoe County Health District, and Southern Nevada Health District. And they have been doing a ton of work throughout the state. Um, Immunize Nevada organized a statewide mass media campaign aligned with COVID-19 messaging. Um, they've been conducting community outreach with community health workers. Um, all of our partners have been organizing and implementing flu vaccination clinics and um, there's been a lot of partner engagement to message to targeted populations. We created a flu and COVID-19 task force with Immunize Nevada to engage partners that way. Um, next slide, please. So th that was kind of the impetus for the dashboard um, with enhanced flu vaccination efforts going on and an overall increased interest in flu vaccination data um, we wanted to be able to assess progress and make data visible to partners in the public. And um, the dashboard is updated weekly and it contains influenza vaccination coverage rates by county, age, and gender across the state and compares rates to the two previous flu seasons. 
Um, and this data is coming from Nevada Web IZ, which is the statewide immunization information system. And the link to that is provided on this slide. Um, next slide, please. So I just took some screenshots of the different tabs of the dashboard to give you an idea of the information that's included. Um, there's a comparison of Nevada um, coverage to the, to the rest of the United States um, for the previous three flu seasons. Um, Nevada typically ranks last or close to it compared to the rest of the states in the United States for um, influenza um, vaccination coverage. Uh, we also have a list broken down uh, up to um, the currently of the, the county level coverage for um, flu vaccination. And then um, get, to give you an idea of the total state, there have been 637,597 um, vaccinations administered and that's about 21% of the population at this point. Um, next slide, please. So then we look at coverage by demography for this flu season as well. So you'll see a, a higher percentage of females have um, been vaccinated this season and then looking at um, it broken down by age. So the total number by age and then the percent coverage by, by the 10 year age groups. Um, I will say we've seen you know people 60 and older going out and getting their flu shot um, in much higher amounts and that's pretty typical. Um, they are at higher risk for flu complications but I think our concern still lies with the younger age groups and um, we hope to see that increase as the season goes on and we're pushing kind of late season flu vaccination, which is important every year, but this year I think it's much more important. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, a trend analysis, you can look at this for the 2018-2019 flu season or the 2019-2020. Um, so the, the bars represent the numbers of flu vaccinations administered by week. Um, and then the percent of people um, vaccinated is the line. And you'll kind of see that the line levels off around um, November and December, which is typical for the flu season. But like I said, we like to see that continue to, to increase as we um, move into 2021. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, we have the county tracker. So this is similar data that we saw in the first tab, but it's just for the two past seasons, so 2018, 2019, and 2019, 2020. You can take a look at this um, on the website. And then next slide. And then lastly, the yearly percentage change. So from 2018, 2019 to 2019, 2020, and then from 2019, 2020 to this current season. And um, just something to kind of point out right now, um, if there are some counties that have experienced a negative percent um, increase. So they had their flu vaccination coverage at this point um, during this season is less than it was last year. And that could be attributed to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but it's just something to um, be aware of. Um, that's my last slide. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Renee, uh, this is Caleb, and uh, I just want to thank you once again for um, your presentation and your patience. I apologize again um, for breaking up this agenda item so that uh, you, you had to stay on longer, but this is extremely valuable information, and uh, um, I'd like to hear from members of the, uh, the, the task force now to see if they have any questions, but um, my, my, my only comment is just um, for, for you to... Um, just thank you for all of the work that uh, you did and your team has done in order to put this together. And uh, I think this is a good um, trial run or, or a good um, pilot program for the, um, the, the vaccination effort that's going to be underway here shortly for, for the pandemic so we can get some of those things worked out. So I appreciate that and I'm um, not surprised, but uh, grateful for um, all of the forward looking and, and forethought that's gone into this. Any other members of the uh, task force like to provide uh, comments or questions at this time? Caleb, this is Terry Reynolds. I, I had a question on this is how do we, um, obviously we're not getting the message out and people are not going and getting vaccines and we're you know, typically lagging behind the national numbers. So you know, what can we do, and this is maybe rhetorical, but what, what can we do 
uh, as a state to increase our numbers to get people to get out and get their vaccine, vaccinations for, for the flu. And it appears that we have, as I said, lagged over the years and not been um, <clears throat> as diligent as a state in getting those vaccines. Yeah, I think, so there is, a, there's a lot of misconceptions about flu vaccine. I think um, just as with COVID, the messaging is really important. And um, so I immunize Nevada is doing a ton of work with that and trying to get the messaging out. And I think another big part of that is having local leaders, people who are trusted in communities, putting out that flu messaging as well on, on the local levels um, to so there, it's coming from a trusted source. Um, I think that's a big part of it. And, and just keep kind of pushing that message into the later flu season. Like I said, it usually kind of cuts off or uh, peters off at the end of November into December. And so continuing to promote that and making it available to people. I know this is a challenge, especially now because of the pandemic and then we're trying to roll out this COVID vaccine response. But um, I think the messaging is a big thing and having it easily available to people. I think um, sometimes the, the vaccination infrastructure um, isn't isn't the same in different parts of the state. And so that's another issue, just access as well. Um, so I don't know, Candace, you want to add anything? Uh, thank you, Renee. I, I think I would just say that um, for this flu season, our rate is actually up compared to last year. So even when you see some of those counties that um, are, in, are negative, um, some of these counties have done a tremendous job and have actually increased from last year. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments at this time? This is Felicia. Go ahead. Hi, um, thank you, Chair Cage. Uh, so quick question, um, has, uh, has there been any type of coordination with school districts to um, also ensure that um, school employees are, are getting vaccinated? especially those that have um, chosen to go back uh, to in-person instruction. Um, this is Candace McDaniel. I, I see Jeannie. I don't know if, if you wanted to make a comment. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, uh, every year we coordinate, at least in the Quad Counties with the schools, we've coordinated with all four school districts and we offered, um, usually we're in the classrooms and doing those vaccinations on campus and we obviously couldn't do that this year. So um, in the quad region, we actually set up micro community vaccination events at the different schools. And so each of the school districts was very generous with having us do these events after hours. And so families could drive through, teachers could drive through. And um, even though we've seen a reduction in vaccination rates this year among school children, uh, we had a lot of community members and the teachers say that they really appreciated us doing that. We did them in, com in combination with our COVID testing at the same time. So people who were not symptomatic were able to get their flu shot and get a COVID test at the same time. So we had a lot of people who appreciated having those opportunities. So the schools have been incredible to work with for, for us as community partners. Thank you for that information, and um, and I am also aware that you have worked um, with um, with private schools on doing and doing events at um, their schools as well as they have communicated that to me. So thank you, I appreciate that, and um, I hope you continue to um, work with um, some of these districts that have not uh, fully um, open school buildings, um, so that um, um, te these teachers that may be working at home um, are are thinking about and. Uh, and get, having an, a, some type of opportunity or event to um, also get vaccinated. So thank you. Thank you for that discussion. Do we have any other questions or comments uh, regarding this presentation here? I am seeing and hearing none. Um, thank you again, uh, Candace and Shannon and Renee for all of your hard work on this program. And I think this dashboard is great. And um, we will uh, we'll look forward to seeing that updated uh, here in the future as well. So with that, we will close out um, agenda item number six once again, and we will open up agenda item number nine uh, and go to um, uh, Felicia Gonzalez who will provide a, a, 
uh, some introductory remarks and then to um, Superintendent uh, Ebert. Um, so uh, Jackie, if you could go ahead and bring up um, uh, any presentations associated with this as well, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cage. We do not have a, um, a presentation to put up. So I'll go ahead and I will um, um, get this item um, started. Um, so good afternoon, almost afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting the Nevada Department of Education to have a full item on today's agenda. I am joined today by, by my colleague, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Joan Ebert, and Chief Strategy Officer, Jessica Todman. As I usually do in my report, I want to give a brief status update on where our Nevada schools are relative to in-person versus virtual or distance learning. The Clark County School District um, recently posted a draft plan for in-person learning to its board in November, but have delayed making any decisions regarding a return to in-person learning for, until January. The Washoe County School District Board voted last week to shift to full-time distance learning for grades 6 through 12, um, but will maintain in-person learning for kindergarten through fifth grade students. The Alco County School District has been making the transition to hybrid learning for the past few weeks, as I noted in my last report. Five school districts are still offering in-person learning to all students. Those are Esmeralda, Eureka, Lincoln, Pershing, and White Pine. The remaining districts are offering some combination of in-person, hybrid, and distance learning. Importantly, families have a choice to choose full-time distance learning if that option makes the most sense to them. Charter and private schools have been making individual determinations based on their local context. That ends my, my part of the report. I am now happy to hand it over to Superintendent Ebert to talk about the current context and how the current context for education is affecting our students and our communities. Superintendent Ebert. Thank you, Felicia. Um, and thank you for the record, Superintendent Ebert. Um, I am really We've been giving thanks a lot over the last week, but just being able to join the conversation, um, I am thankful that uh, you have allowed us to have a full agenda item here uh, this morning. Um, we have a lot to uh, share, and I know Felicia's done an amazing job um, in doing that over um, and being part of this um, committee. So thank you for the entire committee. And I also, all of, all of our health um, care workers, our community leaders, our superintendents, and just know everybody's coming together in a different way. As Director Whitley was saying, it's, this, is, this crisis has given us the opportunity to think differently and do our business differently. Um, and education is one of those areas. So I wanna share a little bit with you um, this morning about our current experiences that our educators, our students, our families, um, are having and why your support of education as part of the state's ongoing COVID response is so critical. Since this fall, I've had the opportunity to spend multiple days in classrooms in Washoe County School District. And the experience of seeing firsthand how the community has come together to provide safe and healthy learning environments has helped me to assure our public health partners that their expectations are being met. Um, I spoke with students of all ages. I watched a kindergartner skip down the hall with her mask on. And all of these children, um, when I've had the conversations and opportunity, you know, socially distanced, my own mask, everything else, they tell me that um, wearing their masks and practicing the social distancing, they're fine with. And they understand that by doing that, that they can continue to see their teachers, engage with their friends, and have an educational environment that is face-to-face. -face. So while we struggle with health and safety enforcement in other settings um, as a state, I am proud to tell you that our schools continue to prioritize face coverings, social distancing, 
frequent hand washing and other practices that are enabling you and the schools to keep the doors open. Um, and in fact, as Felicia mentioned, the Washoe County School District, um, huge shoot, shout out to their uh, superintendent, Krista McNeil, and their board. Uh, you know, I was with them um, along with uh, Director um, Caleb Cage to have a conversation about distance education. And they, they remain a model, not only for us here in the state, having fully online, hybrid, and fully face-to-face. -face. So it's not only a model here in Nevada, but it is also a model that is being looked at around the nation. Um, Director Cabe, as I mentioned, Cage, excuse me, that's a combination of, of Caleb and Cage, uh, continues to be a great partner to the Nevada Department of Education and the school districts across the state, um, as well as Director Whitley and his entire team. Uh, last week, you know, we spoke with the Washoe County Board. They made the shift. It was a difficult decision for that board to go from um, a hybrid model in grades six through 12 with the opportunity for children to be fully online um, to that movement and shift to fully online for those upper grades. Um, at that meeting, Director Cage shared meaningful statistics that helped that board make their determination. And because some of our schools in our state have had their school buildings um, open since August, we have been responding to the pandemic um, since the last spring. We have amassed data sets related to COVID incidents for our school aged children um, here in Nevada. And this data shows us that Clark County where school buildings have been closed since March, um, except in their remote rural communities has a higher per capita rate of COVID-19 in children age five and under five through nine and 10 through 14 than Washoe County. And again, this difference is despite the Clark County um, adopting a fully distance learning model. Additional uh, data, we know that Washoe County has a higher per capita rate for those age 15 through 19, um, but that disparity is also driven by the children that are ages 18 and 19. And so those data go back to the beginning of the pandemic. When we look back to the start of the school year, uh, this situation changes. Since August 10th, Washoe County does in fact have consistently higher rates per capita in all childhood groups. However, and this is why we're talking today and why we're having this data. However, state public health officials, including the state biostatistician, interprets this change as primarily as part of the overall transmission in the community and not tied to in-person education. And so some evidence that supports this interpretation is as follows. For this period, 73% of the total cases in Clark were in Clark and 20% were in Washoe. Comparatively, 71% of the case, cases in school age children were in Clark and 21% were in Washoe. And so this implies that the higher rates in Washoe currently are persistent across all age groups and not an indicator of in-school spread. So additionally, it's important to note that a growing body of research nationally, not just the data we talked about here in Nevada, um, but nationally on COVID-19 show that schools and childcare centers are not major vectors of spread. The difference is attributed to safety measures. Thank the superintendents, the teachers, all of the education community um, and the ability to enforce them directly within school buildings. And um, that is extremely important to have those data um, separate as we continue to move forward. We are also thankful that the state and local government counties efforts continue to provide the needed PPE testing, the contact tracing. I heard COVID-19, the trace app mentioned several times. Um, all of those components have been essential in keeping our school buildings open and our schools safe. Uh, we've also seen that countries around the world do everything that they can do to keep schools open. 
And to quote a recent article from the Washington Post, what the data increasingly shows is that the best way to protect teachers and students isn't to shut schools down, is to focus on all the measures that will keep them and their families, friends, and neighborhoods safe outside of the classroom. And so throughout this entire pandemic, we have prioritized students' social, emotional, and physical health while maintaining a focus on our corner, cornerstone value, which is equity, and that every single child in Nevada deserves to have equitable access to high quality educational, inter, excuse me, opportunities. As we're moving forward, what we see in the learning landscape in Nevada is that our students that come from high middle um, zip codes their progress in math achievement um, is continuing to move up, specifically in those, while children that are in low zip, zip code areas, their achievement is going down. So you have a K curve where, um, a K graph, excuse me, where you have those that have, have continued to have their learning excel, accelerated, but those that do not, their learning has slowed and in some instances um, has not continued. And we need to have the continuation of learning happen with our students um, across the state. So of course, our concerns about equity do not end um, with just the academic disparities that are happening, um, but everything that we see. And I guess what I want to kind of frame here is that in the educational environment, there are many pieces that we need to look at. We need to look at the, the transmission and COVID itself. That's one piece of the information. We need to look at the educational attainment, um, what is happening and where our students are learning and where they are not. Um, some of our students are thriving in an online environment. They didn't realize they, they could. Um, and so now some of, you know, that's a great success. And th at the same time, we're finding that some of our students are not thriving and need those additional supports that only transpire in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, so that's kind of the second piece. Um, I'm thankful to this group body and then also to uh, Melissa Peak Bullet. I know that we're starting to create that second piece of data for school school districts, school buildings, um, so that the community can see um, where uh, and how many students um, and educators are affected or quite frankly not affected the same rate as the community as a whole. As we're looking at this, um, we also look at the social emotional well being of our children. And I know that our communities across the state um, have shared um, how, um, and this is where Dr. Woodard excels um, in, in her field the social emotional and the separation of our children um, from an adult learning environment has taken its toll. We also know that it's not only with our children, but it's with the adults. Um, as well. So that's another piece of the data that we need to look at. The final piece of data is um, the economy and linking schooling and the economy together. We are a system. We're not schools over here, economy over here, other components of government here. We are an entire system. And the governor made a strong call to Nevadans asking them to continue to follow the safety measures that you all push every single meeting, every single day, every single minute. Um, but he emphasized the push so that our school buildings can remain open. And we, we know that this pandemic um, that we're in caused an economic crisis, which also created a mental health crisis and keeping children in school buildings is a key way to ensure that they're getting the support that they desperately need. And we are acute, acutely aware of the detrimental effects that the shutdown has had on the economy. And that we have actually, we know that they're uh, meeting today as, as this meeting is going on as well. Um, and while we've had our casinos, our hotels, restaurants, bars, 
open, the majority of our school buildings across the state have been closed. And as long as school buildings are closed, our economy can't fully reopen. We know that adults, some of our adults are staying home with children because the children need the supervision during the day and they are not able um, to go and participate um, in the economy. So there are a lot of moving parts that leadership within the, within the state has looked at and we need to have it right in front of us and, and talk about the fact that if we're comfortable keeping bars, restaurants, gyms, retail establishments open, there's no reason we cannot create safe opportunities for students to have access to in-person learning. And so that's why I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak with you today because we need your help. Since July, decisions regarding various instructional approaches have been in the hands of districts leaders and school boards. And across the state, schools are relying on the support of local public health officials to make informed decisions about excluding students and staff who have been exposed, as well as to make decisions about closing school buildings for periods of time, if necessary, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So we're grateful that schools have had the local authority to make decisions about their learning model and that we have largely operated outside of automatic restrictions based on um, assessed risk levels. Um, we've also had the opportunity to meet twice with our local health districts and our partners in the health and human services to discuss this and to discuss how to build consensus on the need to reopen our buildings, all of our buildings um, to a face-to-face -face option. So today I'm asking for your support uh, to build out metrics that would help our local partners make determinations about school reopening. Um, those metrics would reflect the growing body of research that shows that schools are not vectors of community spread. Those metrics would also recognize the dire need to get our children back into school buildings and only consider complete closures under the most dire circumstances. We need to think differently about what we do and how we do it. So I want to thank this task force for your time today and your partnership. And quite frankly, I look forward to your leadership in moving education in this state um, forward and into the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Superintendent Ebert. And uh, <clears throat> we appreciate your collaboration, of course, um, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez has been an, an excellent advocate and uh, partner throughout this entire task force process. So we appreciate, we know that comes at, at, a, at a cost to you and your operation um, to, to share someone as uh, talented as she is uh, on a nearly weekly basis. Um, but it's been, an, it's been a great resource to us um, as we work with our county partners and local health authority partners throughout the state. Um, what it sounds like to me, um, so to, to, to sort of try to encapsulate the, um, the, the next steps based on your comments, um, we, have, we have heard, um, you know, um, my boss here, Governor Sislak, has made the point of um, prioritizing, uh, reprioritizing, prioritizing, uh, keeping students in class and in school. Um, those you referred to the comments that I made at the Washoe County School District meeting, school board meeting, um, I guess it was last week now, and um, uh, which, which echoed those comments as well as your comments here today. Um, those are, th those begin, those provide the, the foundation, the operating principle um, that we're working with here. Um, the, the request or the action item is for us to, um, I believe, um, work specifically with local health authorities in order to develop metrics um, for, uh, for um, student or faculty exclusions, school closures, uh, and other mitigation measures that may, be, may remain separate and apart from uh, the mitigation measures that um, uh, we work with our county and, and local health authorities 
um, on regarding overall community spread and 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 that's based on all of the reasons that you outlined is that is that an accurate um, uh, uh, overview of your comments and and recommendation or request from us director cage very succinct and absolutely thank you well i think that that is um that is something we could certainly engage in and um, i think all of the arguments that you made to get there were, were critical to make as well. So I, um, I, I, I would like to follow up with um, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez and um, you, if you're available, your, um, your uh, chief of staff, um, Jessica and others um, to, uh, to, to begin that conversation. I know that conversation is underway in some capacity, uh, but that's certainly something that we could uh, collaborate with you all on and, and make sure that we're bringing our uh, local counterparts into as well. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, you know, it's it, the educational uh, team and the whole community has taught, we've all talked about education. I just think that we really needed to elevate it. And so again, I appreciate your time, the task force time today um, to elevate and look at those components so that we can ensure our children have the opportunity to be face-to-face -face, um, and that families actually have choice that if they don't feel that um, they're ready for their children to go back face-to-face -face, that they also have the opportunity to be at a distance as well. Are there other members of the task force who have questions or comments for Superintendent uh, Ebert regarding her uh, request or overview any of the points that she's made? Okay, um, just want to say once again, thank you for being here, but more important, thank you for what you're doing uh, to lead this, um, this, this critical um, part of all of our communities throughout the state through this pandemic. Um, Superintendent, and thank you again for uh, lending us um, Felicia in the process as well. She's been invaluable to, to our work, so thank you. At this time, um, I know that we have uh, two agenda items left, I believe, that are uh, action items before we go to, um, or excuse me, discussion items before um, the meeting closes. I, I know that we have um, representatives from uh, Pharma who are here to provide us an update on vaccine efforts to date. Uh, the Pharma is, of course, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America trade organization. Um, and they will provide us uh, an overview on efforts to develop the COVID-19 um, vaccine to date. Um, we have, uh, we've been working with um, uh, pharma and representatives from their organization uh, to provide us this information. And uh, we have um, Dr. James Main um, here from, from uh, pharma who will be providing us an update. Um, um, Jim Main is the Vice President of Science and Regulatory Advocacy for Pharma, uh, where he provides leadership um, for pharma's involvement in a number of science-based public and private partnerships and works to support um, the pharmaceutical industry's effort, efforts to uh, evolve contemporary R&D ecosystems on um, drug development pathways. There's uh, he's obviously got um, um, quite a resume and background here, um, but I'd like to just uh, leave the introduction there and turn it over to um, Dr. Main at this point to provide an update to the task force on the pharmaceutical industry's development of uh, vaccine to date. Well, thanks for that introduction and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, I'm Jim Main, I'm with the uh, pharma group in the science and regulatory affairs area. And I'm very much um, uh, uh, eager to tell you about all the fantastic work that's being done in our industry uh, when it comes to vaccines to prevent COVID-19. Um, you know, at the pace things are moving, if I had prepared comments yesterday, they'd be out of date by today. So um, I've been uh, working to, to try and, and, and keep um, the, these, these comments contemporary. I, I think I'd like to just make a, a few points um, in, in opening and then perhaps um, leave as much time as possible for any questions that you might have. 
um, in, in consideration of the rapid moving and, and rapidly changing um, amount of information that's been available. Um, the, the pharmaceutical industry uh, kicked into high gear on, on, uh, uh, in response to the COVID challenge very early in the year. Uh, our R&D leaders issued a, a statement of support and, and uh, a statement of commitment um, way back in, in, in January, in fact. And, and, and while it's not always apparent, there is a, a large ecosystem of, of um, tens of thousands of, of dedicated scientists, physicians, and other researchers that have been working to, uh, to crack the code on the coronavirus to create opportunities um, to defeat it and to bring those opportunities through development process to, uh, to Americans. Um, I think we stand here today in December um, looking at the fruits of those labors um, with, with, uh, with very eager eyes. Uh, we now have on the cusp of availability uh, a couple of different vaccines, uh, but I, I do wanna make the, uh, the, the point that those didn't just come from thin air. Uh, they, they came from the efforts of um, industry and an industry that had created the pre-existing um, capacity and expertise and had the institutional knowledge uh, to begin at a very advanced place and then advance from there very rapidly. Um, so we were able to bring forward um, not just one or two vaccines. We're not looking for a vaccine. We're looking for an entire uh, toolbox of vaccines. And, and the fact that we have now three vaccines that have announced positive information from large phase three trials is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, another point I wanted to make is that the vaccines that are coming forward are coming forward from multiple different um, companies and are multiple different types of vaccines. I'd be happy to share additional detail on those types um, and, and, uh, with the level of interest that you have. But um, suffice it to say that there's been somewhere between seven and 12 different types of vaccines, different fundamental approaches to making a vaccine that have been applied here. And, and we refer to those as, as multiple shots on goals. So we've had, we've had 29 um, to 35, depending on how you count, vaccines enter clinical research, enter clinical development um, that have made it through preclinical testing. And of those 35 or so vaccines, we now have um, somewhere between, uh, and I always have to approximate because uh, uh, I'm using international numbers here, somewhere between seven and, and 10 that are um, in, in that advanced phase three study. These, these represent multiple different types of vaccines, as I said. So we have multiple shots in multiple different categories. And, and I think the, the, the thing I'd like to leave you with on that point is, is multiple shots on goal is how you get multiple shots in goal. We really need multiple vaccines, not just one. And, and getting multiple shots in, in goal leads to multiple shots in, in arms. Um, the, the process has been, I think, very well uh, captured by the media and very well uh, disclosed by, by the companies involved. There's been a, an unprecedented level of, of illumination of the pathway for bringing a vaccine out of the research laboratories into clinical development and then into to regulatory review and distribution. Um, I'd like to comment just a little bit on distribution and then I'll, I'll close with preliminary comments. Um, the, the, the process of bringing the vaccine forward has gone very rapidly. We, we, we transitioned what is normally a lengthy research phase in, in literally in a matter of days. And, and, and as spectacular as that sounds, it's, it, it's, it's even more spectacular to, to watch happen in, in real life. Literally within about 72 hours of the disclosure of the uh, genetic sequence of the virus, the first prototype vaccines had been created in research laboratories. And I just wanna let that, that sink in for a while. So when people ask, how did you move so fast? How did you get to a vaccine in under a year? That's one of the big answers is on the front end, the industry was able to move incredibly quickly because of that infrastructure that was in place. The other key though is on the back end in that manufacturing and distribution. Um, industry has been manufacturing at risk, not just clinical supply levels of, of vaccine to supply the clinical research, but 
product level of vaccine so that they can, can with, with um, uh, honesty say that, that they will be available within hours of a positive decision from regulators, the vaccine will be available and will, will have been already distributed regionally um, such that it can begin to reach um, the patients who need them within hours. That work done, that manufacturing work done at risk and in advance. So that's the other big time saving on the back end um, when usually a company will wait until they've seen that signal of, of efficacy, that, that information or good news from phase three trials, that, that's when they'll start ramping up manufacturing. The ramping up of manufacturing has been going on virtually all year. So I'll leave those, those thoughts there and then uh, uh, open the floor to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Main. This is, uh, this is Caleb. I really appreciate that. Um, you said something a minute ago, and I want to make sure uh, I heard it right. You said, um, how quickly after the virus uh, began to appear were vaccine, vac uh, were vac did vaccination efforts begin? So prototype vaccines were designed within literally within 72 hours of the receipt of the sequence, the genetic sequence of the vaccine. Those prototype vaccines then had to be tested preclinically before they actually were administered to human subjects in clinical trials. And that process took several months. I believe the first, if, if I recall correctly, the first clinical studies started approximately in, in May in, in that time frame. So um, that, that, that preclinical process, which normally can take a couple of years going from the identification of a new virus to the availability of a, a vaccine to test in, in, in the clinic, um, was compressed down to a matter of weeks. I, that's what I thought you said. I just wanted to make sure I, I, um, I heard it correctly. Um, you, you also mentioned that that's remarkable and thank you for sharing that. Um, you also mentioned um, uh, some of the efforts that were going on um, in other countries around the world. I saw um, just in the news um, recently that um, the, the UK has approved of their vaccine, we know that um, China, uh, Russia, and other other um, entities are developing um, uh, vaccine as well. Um, the just so we're we're clear, um, pharma represents some global corporations that will also have uh, that that are also producing vaccine for the United States. Is that is that a fair statement? Is that an accurate statement as well? Yes, and in, in fact. Um... On, on, on my resume, you'll note that I spent 30 years working for uh, Pfizer, and I'm a very proud alumni of the company that um, brought the first vaccine out of clinical development and into uh, uh, regulatory review. Of course, Pfizer's- and they are a member Germany company great. of Pharma, of course. Great. Uh, I could ask questions and have discussions with you all day about this. So I just want to say <laughs> thank you for, uh, for, for being here, but I'd like to open it up to other members of the task force who might have uh, questions or comments regarding uh, the development of uh, vaccine to date. I, uh, I want to say once again, I really appreciate you being here and providing this, um, this, this overview. And I know we have uh, um, your colleagues' contacts and you have ours. If there's anything that we can do for you um, as this process continues forward, we'd be happy to work with you. But thank you so much for, for that overview. Okay. Uh, hearing no, no other questions, we will... Um, we will close out this agenda item, and uh, which was agenda item number seven, and we will go to agenda item number five. Uh, I believe we have um, James here uh, from uh, the State Biostatistician's Office to give us an overview of where things stand here in the state of Nevada. James, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Karachi. Um, before I begin, I just wanna say that um, this presentation and all the analytics that we produce from our office is from an entire team, our COVID analytics team. So um, even though my name's on this presentation, it was a collaborative effort with everyone. Um, so if we can move on to slide three. On here, this represents the data that was on our dashboard on December 2nd. Um, so 
the values themselves, I think we've kind of become somewhat normalized to them, but since our last meeting or since the last time we presented on this on November 18th, there has been some drastic shifts. So in terms of our case rate, we came from 1,228 just two weeks ago. Now we're currently at 1,718 for mortality. We went from six as a 14 day rolling average to now we're at 13. This morning when our team updated the dashboard, we're currently at 14. Um, that is the average over the 14 day period and testing has increased from 324 to 476. So basically across the board, we're seeing increasing values for all indicators. Um, and for the most part, and with some fluctuations on a daily basis, we are hitting new highs on a daily basis as well. So as you can see with our positivity rate of 17.6%, this is a new high and we've been hitting new highs for the most part for um, the most recent few days. Uh, when we compare this to uh, other regions nearby, like Arizona and California, our case rate is surpassing the, them as well. Uh, so once again, just really emphasizing the point that our indicators are going up. If we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this um, page represents the hospitalization data, um, very similar to what we discussed from the, the past and what Dr. Lake was discussing as well. We are seeing increasing trends in confirmed and suspected hospitalizations. Um, more so now we're seeing this across the board, not just in the northern region of Nevada, but we're seeing this in the north, the south, and the rural areas as well. Um, so similarly, we are hitting new highs um, on a daily basis. There is, once again, some fluctuations, um, as you can probably tell by the dashboard update that was done this morning, but we are still continuing to increase. I want to indicate that's not on here that uh, Dr. Lake's team um, sent us earlier this morning, uh, the daily hospital stats. Uh, this shows the percent of staff beds currently occupied. In the northern region, 91% are occupied. In the southern region, we have uh, 81%. Um, so those rates are pretty high and, and somewhat alarming. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this, is, this slide represents the positivity rate, uh, very similar to what we discussed before. That green line is where we want to be, be at, or at that point or lower. That's the World Health Organization goal. We're currently at 17.6% and over the past um, month and a half or so or two months, uh, we have been continuing to climb. Having such a high test positivity rate generally indicates that there is wide community spread. Uh, fortunately, we are doing continued testing and testing rates are going up, but that's not quite meeting the demand. So we are um, still having a high number of those tests coming back positive, which is not what we want to see. Next slide, please. This um, chart represents the median time for specimen collection to report. So once a specimen is collected from an individual, how long does that um, lab take to get back or report it to the state? Uh, the big takeaway from this, because I know there's a lot of information on here, is that for Nevada as a whole, it takes approximately three days after a specimen is collected to be reported to the state. Um, two weeks ago, that number was two, which might not sound like that much, but as we know, the median is the 50% or the halfway point. So that is slowly shifting to a, a longer period. Uh, of course, we do have a lot of variability depending on the specific county, depending on the specific type of lab. Um, and we are seeing fluctuating numbers. A few of these indicators have gone down a very little bit, but for the most part, we are seeing increasing numbers across the board. On uh, the next slide, if you don't mind moving there, uh, this slide does, I think, a much better job of representing that, that change and that shift. So that graph at the very top looks at all of the labs um, that are being reported and the specific number of days it takes to get reported after specimen collection date. So if we were to look at just the same day, one day and two day, that represents 49% of those labs are coming in within a two day period. Uh, if we contrast this with what we had in November 18th, we were sitting around 64%. Now ma majority of that did shift to the three day period, but ideally we can get this as short as possible um, to reduce continued spread. Um, once again, still variability uh, depending on the county, but we are seeing increasing trends um, in general. And once again, I know there's a lot of information on here, so definitely open to any questions afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is our county tracker page. Um, this represents the data that was um, released last Monday on November uh, 23rd. At that time, 13 of the 17 counties um, were flagged for elevated disease transmission. The ones that were not flagged were Mineral, Pershing, Story, and White Pine. 
um, all the counties that were flagged um, had a high test positivity rate and had a high case rate per 100,000. Um, in terms of the average number of tests per day per 100,000, only of the ones that were flagged, only um, Lincoln was uh, had a low number. Um, so that that is good in terms of we want people not to be in, in this category. Uh, but if we move on to the next slide, when we come to the present day or from a couple of days ago this past Monday, 16 of the 17 counties are now flagged for elevated disease transmission. All of them are still flagged for having a high case rate. All of them are still flagged for having a high test positivity rate. Uh, Lincoln has increased their average number of tests per day to now 84, so they are moving closer to that 100 threshold, but this should be um, relatively concerning. Now, we did include a small footnote on this one. Um, up until this point and all the data prior to this, um, all of our county tracker pages had included um, prison populations in these indicators. There have been discussions about potentially excluding them, specifically for the county tracker page, not for the entire dashboard. Um, at the end of this presentation, we did an analysis to see what impact that would have. Um, so I, I just want to emphasize this includes that population and we're going to get into a discussion where um, they are excluded and see how that might impact on the overall numbers. Um, so hold on tight. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide and the next uh, three, sli or three slides, including this one, um, this is kind of our, our general trend slides. So this first one represents the trend data for the first indicator, this testing per day per 100,000. Um, ideally, everyone could be in the white region, but as you can tell, uh, we're shifting from um, a lot of counties being in the red to more being in the white, which is great. Um, so this represents that counties are doing more tests per day uh, for their individual populations. Um, still, Lincoln is the only one that is currently, currently being flagged for this past Monday, but they are very close to, be, uh, to passing that threshold. Next slide, please. Now this is where it kind of turns a little bit, um, where for the cases for 100,000, we came from a point where a lot of counties were in the white, and now we're shifting to a point where a lot of counties are now in the red. Um, so as of this Monday, as of the past three weeks, actually, um, 16 of the 17 counties were flagged for this. Um, Story County has increased to 134, so theirs is going up, um, but they still haven't quite passed that threshold of 200. Uh, next slide, please. Similarly, we see the same thing with test positivity rates. Um, we shifted from a time period where there's a lot of counties in the white to more counties in the red. Uh, one of the things that I do want to kind of put a small disclaimer on, um, some of these counties with low population sizes or low number of tests, um, you might see fluctuating numbers in their test positivity rate. Uh, that will normally subside over time, but just keep in mind this is a moving um, average so that, that that will shift um, as we get further on as well. So um, some counties with a really, really high test positive rate, just keep that in mind as you're assessing those. And the final slide, um, this is our county tracker comparison. So I know this is probably, the, this, I take it back, this is the newest slide that we put on this slide deck. There's a lot of information on here. So I'm just gonna break this down at a high level and then we'll dive more into detail uh, for the individual uh, components. So the leftmost table represents the current methodology. And just wanna emphasize that this data is as of yesterday, December 2nd. So this will not match what we had um, for the county tracker on November 30th. So they are different numbers, but pretty close. The numbers haven't shifted that much. Um, the overall indicators have stayed the same. So in this instance, um, 16 counties are still flagged for elevated disease transmission, all of them for high case rate, all of them for high test positivity rate. Lincoln County, um, still flagged for a, a low testing rate, 92 right now, so even closer to the 100 threshold. That score column um, in the current methodology, that represents the number of those indicators that county um, were flagged for. So at Carson, um, Churchill, all the way down, they have two because they didn't, they didn't meet the case rate and test positivity thresholds. Lincoln has three, uh, but Story has zero because they met all three of them. The second table represents the data um, or the county tracker if we excluded the prison inmate population. So there, and, and from there you can see that um, we have the same information, testing, case rate, test positivity, as well as the scores. And the last table represents the difference. So I think in my opinion, oh, thank you. Uh, in my opinion, I think this is the most important table. This shows the shift from the current methodology to the um, excluding prison inmate population methodology. 
Now, majority of the counties, there were very minute changes. When I say minute, I mean zero to 3% change. It didn't really change that much at all. Um, that score column, I think, is a pretty good indicator of that. Only Lincoln County had a score difference of one. Uh, basically, by excluding the present inmate population, they now met that testing rate um, indicator. So they dropped down to two, which is great. But the ones that did change, we do want to kind of go into a little more, little bit more detail about to kind of get into those differences. So Carson City, uh, Eureka, Lincoln, Pershing, and White Pine are those differences. Carson City and White Pine, their rates actually went down. But interestingly, Eureka, Lincoln, and Pershing all went up. And so that caused some confusion when we first started discussing the, the changes themselves. Uh, for Carson City and White Pine, this is primarily due to excluding that population itself. But for the counties that did go up, when we looked at the data itself, the, for the prison inmate population, they um, very few to zero uh, of their cases and testing were associated with prison inmate population. So if we were to look this as a fraction, the numerator being um, the tests or the, the cases and the denominator being the population of that county, the counties that went up, the numerator stayed the same. So testing was constant and the cases were constant. It might've gone up by one or, or, or zero, so very little bit. But in those counties, we want to be sure that the numerator and denominator matched. So in the current methodology table, the numerator represents everyone in Nevada and the denominator represents everyone in Nevada. For the second table, because the numerator represents everyone in Nevada minus the prison inmate population, we want to be sure that the denominator matched the same way. So we use data from the state demographer to exclude the prison populations from their denominator counts. So the numerator stayed about the same, but the denominator now went down. And so because the denominator went down and numerator is the same, those rates will now go up. So for Eureka, Lincoln, and Pershing, that's why you see increasing numbers there. Um, in the end, I just do want to emphasize this had zero impact or changes in the overall um, criteria for a county to be flagged for elevated disease transmission, um, but we just wanted to be sure that was clear because I, I can really easily see how that can be misconstrued. Um, and that's pretty much it. So I'm definitely open to any questions. Um, I know that was kind of a new topic that we had discussed. So uh, let me know if you I can answer anything. James, this is Caleb and, and just a couple of items. Um, first of all, uh, as you all know, um, we have not included the, um, the, we did not ask the counties to provide uh, plans for us to review and approve um, this week. And that is, that is because we have, um, uh, the governor has put a, um, uh, a pause as we've called it in place in order for us to assist with driving down um, the metrics and getting these under control. Uh, we did want to continue to have um, this presentation um, that, that James was, was so gracious to provide for us today um, because I think it tells the story that, that is driving these decisions at the state level uh, and the decisions, the difficult decisions the governor is having to make. And those, um, those uh, maps of the statewide county criteria um, that went from um, mostly red to nearly all red, um, tell a very compelling story about the cases uh, or the situation of COVID in the state of Nevada. Um, so I, I just wanna point that out. The, the second thing I'd like to say is um, regarding the, um, the, the work that you did on, on the prison population and you covered it extremely well, uh, much better, much better than, than I uh, could by far uh, because of the technical aspects, of course, um, but I just want to point out from the, um, from the, to, to frame it properly as, and you did uh, this as well in your remarks. And that is, this isn't to, to discount or exclude uh, those cases that are in um, the prison population here in the state of Nevada. It is intended to show, um, just as we have done with um, uh, tribal reservations and skilled nursing facilities and other um, uh, interests throughout the state, it's intended to show that these, um, these cases essentially are um, in state facilities, they're in closed facilities, and with the exception of employees and guards and otherwise going in and out of the facilities into the communities, which are measured differently than, than what you proposed in that uh, three-part graph, um, 
that those those cases are separate from the day-to-day -day cases that say Carson City Health and Human Services or Washoe County Health District or others would have any jurisdiction over. Um, so it's not to say these cases don't matter. It's to say we understand that these cases are involved in 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 a uh, a different population within the community than say um, certain zip codes within a county or otherwise. And and again, I think you covered that very well. I just wanted to. Um, to, to reiterate it. And then finally, before I open it up to our colleagues here, um, James, I just want to say um, the work that you and, and your team and Kyra um, have done here in presenting this data for the state has been absolutely critical to our ability to understand what this virus is doing and critical to our ability to be transparent with the public um, and to facilitate these decisions that are um, public health and public safety related decisions for the state. Um, and uh, I wasn't just saying it to be nice. Uh, you know, you are capable of presenting this data in ways that um, I think most of us are unable to and are understandable for somebody like me who's a history major to, to see um, the very important factors and how we get to these, these data um, in order to make these decisions. So we're incredibly grateful um, that you're working at the state and that we have access to your talents and capabilities and for you taking the time to present to us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Open it up now to uh, members of the task force to provide, to ask any questions or um, uh, any follow-up regarding the situation in the state of Nevada per um, James's comments. Hey, well, this is Terry Reynolds. I, I had a, a couple of questions. One is that, um, I know that um, you know the testing and the, and the time frame has actually gotten pretty good in the larger uh, counties, Washoe and Clark County. But I think I've heard reports that the rural areas are still um, seeing some extended times, and I'm wondering <clears throat> if if that is still the case uh, with the uh, you know in in some of the smaller uh, counties uh, in terms of who they have their testing done and the possible backlog because of what's happening in the larger urban areas. The other part of that is um, with the CDC guidelines in terms of um, basically uh, quarantining and uh, and looking at uh, what they recommend for the uh, the time frame of that. Whether um, even with the shorter time frames, are we still going to be kind of missing the mark? Um, to be able to keep people out of uh, going back to work or to school or um, and then, you know, spreading uh, additional infections. So I, I'm concerned about still, are we getting to the root of, of getting uh, our testing results speeded back up again? That's a great question. Thank you, Terry. Um, when we look at the data itself, um, if we look specifically at the urban counties like Clark and Washoe County, for Clark, the median reporting time is two days. For Washoe, it's a little bit higher at three days. But what you're saying is absolutely right. When we look at the other rural, or the, the rural counties themselves, you, you do see fluctuations depending on the type of lab or the specific lab that is reporting. But in general, we're seeing numbers that are four, five, or six uh, median reporting days. Some counties are a little bit lower, like Lincoln County, they have two but the majority of them are three or greater. Um, so rural counties do um, definitely have a, a longer period for reporting from stress and collection data. You're absolutely right about that. Um, for your point about the, um, the new CDC guidance, um, it is definitely an evolving situation and we are in the process of eventually looking at including additional indicators like policy changes and looking at how um, other kind of federal guidance impacts the overall rates and cases um, within Nevada. Um, so we will have more information on that, but there's always going to be a lag for that, um, that reporting and the data collection and the kind of the report building process of that. So we won't have that quite yet, but um, any kind of new indicators or variables will definitely have an impact on the overall trends. Thank you. That's, that's good. Terry, this is Julia. I'll also add, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it in my comments um, as well, but with those new standards, the individual would need to test at day five and then receive the results at day seven to have a true impact on that. 
Um, so with our turnaround times, that's, that's highly unlikely. So probably most people will go from a 14 day to a 10 day um, with no tests, no symptoms. Um, just realistically, the other thing is CDC and our federal partners want us to look at point of care, or those more rapid tests. And we've been challenged with that just um, with false negatives and false positives, but we need to look at how do we incorporate those in addition to the gold standard PCR tests that, that do take longer, but again, are considered the gold standard. For now, I would say uh, for most people who are close contacts, um, you go from a 14 day to a 10 day with no tests. That's probably the most reasonable expectation for, for our contacts. Because we get a lot of inquiries uh, by business about keeping their employees out, as you know, and so they're concerned. And so it's good news for them, if even if they have to go from 14 days to 10 days. And I understand the issue of, you know, to be really effective with testing, you have to wait four or five days after the contact to be able to, to make sense, you know, to make sure it works um, and does pick up something. But, uh, but businesses are always trying to get, you know, their employees back to work. And with as much spread as we've had lately, you know, it, it's if you have a small office, it can decimate out um, that office, as you know. And so we get a lot of calls on that and what's the best way to handle that. So that's why I asked the question. Director Cage, if I could also add, we're still getting calls in public health of our contacts not being able to return back to work at this point. It was 14 days um, because they haven't received a negative test. I just want to reiterate again. Um, 14 days now, 10 days does not require a negative test to return to work. That individual, the 10th day after the exposure may return to work um, as long as they're not symptomatic. So just want to make sure our businesses really understand that clearly um, and that employees can come back at 10 days with no symptoms. Great. Thank you, Julia. Why don't you um, go ahead and continue into your remarks at this point, if you don't mind? Dagny, can I just jump in on the testing real quick, you guys? Absolutely, Dagny, go ahead. Yeah, and Caleb, I just want to follow up on Terry's question and just weigh in a little bit on the test turnaround time, just because there's been so much work done on that. And I just want to recognize all the work that has been done, the state lab by Dr. Pandori and the state in supporting county like Elko County, getting a, a lab set up. It's been just awesome, the amount of work that has happened. Um, all that said, you know, from this, I'm looking at page seven. Um, of James's uh, PowerPoint, and I'm looking at the turnaround times by, you know, percentage by day. And of course, it still looks like Clark is in really good shape because of UMC and Lincoln County along with them, and that we're still seeing really long times uh, in Washoe and then even longer, you know, for those rural counties that depend back on Washoe County to get those tests processed. So, and I don't know, this is sort of a big picture question, and I don't know if anybody has an answer, um, but, you know, do we expect to see this come down a little bit more? I mean, Julia, do you have an idea of where we're at in terms of actually how much, you know, the work, the great work that you have done with the Quest contract, how much that's freed up at the state lab and where we really might be able to see testing times in places like White Pine County and Pershing County, Humboldt County finally, and I, I think Humboldt County sort of gone it on their own as well, finally start to come down. Yeah, Dagny, it's a great question. Um, so I believe the Quest Lab started with the initial facilities, which was our Department of Corrections facilities, maybe a week ago. Melinda can correct me if I'm getting the date wrong. So this data might not be reflected yet in what James presented. So hopefully we'll see that change over time. We're also making great effort to um, move skilled nursing facilities and other uh, facilities that have really high volume testing um, away from the state public health lab so they could truly support our, our public health programs in, in each county going forward. Like I said, I don't think it's reflected in your data now. Uh, the other thing I just want to touch on that you mentioned is setting up satellite sites for the state public health lab. Um, they're doing a, a yeoman's work to try to get equipment um, by December 30th when CARES relief funds ends, but we really do uh, need laboratorians who could work uh, those machines. And then that helps with both courier time, but also in diverting some of those uh, specimens um, from our public health resources in either Clark or Washoe um, to those rural counties. So again, if, if a shout out to people in Nevada, if you are a laboratorian and uh, would be interested in providing services that would greatly impact the turnaround based on courier and getting the specimen uh, turned over quicker in those rural counties. This is Mark Pandori, uh, director of the Nevada State Public Health Lab for the record. And in addition to those things, the, the State Public Health Lab is also increasing its capacity to test, 
um, with an eye towards January when the Quest contracts are no longer in force. Um, we have four more machines coming in. It looks like December 7th right now. It will take time to stand those up, but um, the idea there is to add a substantial amount of bandwidth to testing capability at the state lab itself. There are certain turnaround time issues such as couriers and people actually getting their results out of the system electronically that are beyond our control. But I think over the next month, those should improve as well. But the, the core testing process will very well should become faster in terms of throughput at the state lab because of the equipment in the state lab we have people. Um, this is a very, as Julia just said correctly, there's a, a right now, and you can even see a New York Times article today, which spells out the problem almost perfectly, is that we're now encountering the phase of the problem where money and equipment aren't so much the problem as it is the trained individuals that are required. It's not just training, it's certification. The test that is done is is of a highest level, like PCR is what's called a high complexity test and not just anybody can run it. So just training is not enough, it requires certification. And so I commend Julia for her shout out just now um, because we need that as more than anything now. But um, at least at the state lab, as I said, there are several licensed people that we can that can run the equipment. So at least the bandwidth will increase there. and. Thankfully, uh, the, the Quest contracts are taking the pressure off of us at the time, which will allow us to stand up that equipment because it's really hard to get that equipment up and running when you're dealing with a backlog. So the contracts should allow the state lab to expand capacity so that in January, when a lot of that testing comes back, we can do more. But I really am hesitant to put numbers on it at this moment, but I wanted people to be aware of that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandori and, and um, Dagny for digging into that. I, I would like to add a, uh, an agenda item to the next meeting um, to give a full update on all of that work that you've been a part of. Uh, and of course, Dr. Pandori just mentioned as well and, um, and give us an opportunity to, to um, discuss that in more detail because I think it's critically important and, and appreciate you keeping that at the forefront. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to go back to um, uh, Julia at this point and um, have you provide your update on the contact tracing efforts in the state. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So we're now at 35,644 cases that we've identified as a result of our contact tracing efforts that's statewide. Uh, this is now 22.3% of the total cases reported in our state. And if you recall, um, we were at 25, close to 26 for a period of time, and this is gradually decreasing. Um, it has a, a great deal to do with community spread, and it's much harder to link cases and identify very specific exposures. Um, also, many counties are unable to reach out to the cases timely, as timely as they did a month ago, at least, and in some cases are having to prioritize which cases are being interviewed, um, if at all. Um, in order to make this process more efficient across the state, we will be issuing some guidance. One of those things will be greatly reducing the amount of information that's collected for each case on that interview form. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, recently published guidance on the prioritization of case investigation during times when disease burden is high, which is absolutely a reflection of where Nevada is now. Um, according to CDC, um, health departments who are experiencing this surge or crisis situations around COVID-19 should prioritize case investig investigation interviews to people who tested positive for or were diagnosed with COVID in the past six days. Um, in some jurisdictions, it may also be necessary to prioritize beyond that date um, based on unique demands. Uh, so people diagnosed with COVID are strongly encouraged to notify household contacts if they have received a positive result. Uh, to immediately self-isolate themselves and tell their contacts to self-quarantine and then to seek additional guidance from their health department. Um, as the burden of the disease decreases, CDC notes that health departments should expand um, the investigation back to as much as they can handle, uh, but focus on specimens that were collected in the past 14 days. Um, if more than 14 days have elapsed since the specimen collection, case investigation and contact tracing should not be pursued unless there are unique circumstances associated with the person tested, such as um, it's associated with 
a large outbreak, congregate living, or high density workplace. Um, as you know, we use surge staff, a surge staff um, group to communicate with our close contacts. They have logged a total of 228,642 calls since they initially started in June. Um, just yesterday, they logged over 2,500 calls. Uh, they also text close contacts during that quarantine period and sent over 3,300 text messages just yesterday to over 1,200 contacts. Uh, we did get an 84% response rate from those contacts. Um, again, want to thank everybody for acknowledging the COVID Trace app. Um, we continue to see great growth, uh, which is absolutely necessary to make sure the exposure notifications work and an, it's an effective tool. As of last night, we had a total of 123,960 total downloads. Uh, we've had 61 cases that had the app at the time of their diagnosis, and that resulted in 44 exposure notifications. Uh, one of the challenges with the app, it's not a reflection of the app, but um, our disease investigators need to issue the case a code to trigger um, exposures to be released through the app. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're, ha we're having challenges uh, reaching all the cases timely. And so either the case doesn't get a code to send those exposure notifications, or the time has elapsed 14 days and now 10 days with the CDC guidance um, when a contact would even find value in being notified. Uh, so this week we made a major accomplishment. We entered into an agreement with the Association of Public Health Laboratories, and this will help streamline the delivery of those codes. I'll be able to provide many more updates at coming upcoming meetings on that, but that should um, remove some of the workload from our disease investigators and allow that process to work much more quickly. I just want to pause and acknowledge uh, Tim Robb on our team, um, as well as Dudley and Wes Carr, the developers of the app. Um, this small but mighty team has truly um, given us a new way to look at public health and technology. Um, and I can't um, explain to people how important this is, understanding um, the high level of exposure right now in, in all our communities. Um, the other thing I just want to end with is uh, you may have seen that CDC again issued new gu guidance for the quarantine period. This changed from 14 days since exposure to 10 days if the contact has no symptoms. Um, starting today, contacts can shorten their quarantine period by four days. So for example, if someone's on quarantine right now and they were scheduled to end their quarantine on the 8th, they can now end their quarantine on the 4th if they have no symptoms and then they can return to work with no uh, negative test required. Um, the other option that Director Reynolds brought up is that if there is a test at day five after the exposure and they receive their negative results by day seven, they can return at day seven. Uh, but with testing delays and demand, uh, that could be more challenging than just being able to wait the 10 days no test. Um, for the, those close contacts on quarantine um, that are working with our surge staffing and have signed up for text messaging, they will get a text that says this information hopefully by the end of today so that they get this receipt should they not be um, aware of the task force meeting. So um, so that's that's good news for many of our contacts out there that can return to work. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Julia. Any questions from members of the task force at this time? This is Felicia. Go ahead, Felicia. Thank you so much, Julia, for uh, for that report and, and especially for the information um, regarding the 14 days down to 10 days and um, and um, the five days, um, or excuse me, the and then the seven days with a negative test. Um, that is um, information that our our districts um, are looking for, um, and so I'm looking forward to updating um, some guidance uh, for for our school districts. So thank you. Great, um, Julia. Um, I know it's it's already floating around out there, but um, the uh, if you could provide the technical bulletin over to um, uh, Felicia, I think that would be beneficial as well uh, regarding those days. I don't think that's on our materials for today. Yes, happy to do it. Thank you. Great. Any other questions or comments for Julia? Okay, with that, I, I'd like to go ahead and move to um, the uh, public comment agenda item number 10, closing out this agenda item. 
Um, just as we did before, um, we're gonna take some time to, to make sure there's plenty of opportunity uh, between the delay and otherwise. So um, if uh, Jackie, if you could go ahead and um, ensure that we have the ability for um, people to call in. If you are calling in, please go ahead and unmute yourself by pressing star six now, uh, following the instructions on um, the agenda in two spots or on agenda item number 10 uh, in order to make public comment. Um, I will begin a, uh, a clock on this time as well to ensure that um, we are leaving it open for long enough for people to make comments. And while we uh, prepare for this as well, um, I'll make other comments over that 90 second period. No action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair and comments will not be restricted based on their viewpoint. Um, because there is no physical location for this meeting, uh, public comment may be presented by phone. Uh, again, you can call into the number provided on the agenda and please make sure you press star six to unmute yourself, identify yourself, provide your public comment, and then um, uh, conclude your remarks. When you conclude your remarks, mute yourself again with um, star six. So we will leave public comment open at this time. And um, if you have public comment, please, uh, please begin now. Just want to see if there's anybody else who would like to make public comment at this time. I'm not seeing any. Um, and uh, Jackie, if you could check to see if there's anybody who is trying to uh, call in or anybody in the waiting room. I uh, just want to make sure we're um, doing everything we can in order to um, uh, accommodate public comment. Thanks, Caleb. I'm not showing anyone in the waiting room. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this uh, concludes agenda item number 10. Uh, we will close out um, public comment at this time. And uh, again, I just wanna thank you all for uh, your patience. I know these meetings are, are long, um, lots of important discussion and detail to cover. Uh, at this time, we will, um, uh, I will hear a uh, motion to adjourn. Caleb, this is Terry Reynolds. I'll move to adjourn. Okay. Is there a second? This is Richard Whitley. I move to second. Thank you very much to you both. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. We'll see you again soon and appreciate all of your participation. We're closing down the meeting now.